Welcome to Flash Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere and there's also a Ko-Fi Patreon crypto and thanks button in the info box below the video. Speaking of Patreons, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So a massive shout of thanks and appreciation to Amish Earther, Naughty Thumbnails, Mitch Kennedy, Original D, Rose Rod, The Names Burley, Todd Wazzle, Jason Hornsby, Christoph Fournier, Flat Earth Travolta, J Mels 24, Yu Namento, M Iron 26, Endless, Flat Earth Sage, Goldie McKinn and Retro Bill, uh, Level Plain Poem, Cannabare, Fibroats, Michael Kahn, John Kays, Patrick Gunnels, Banter, Mel B. Styles, Harry Blade, Mobile Max 777, Rob W., Reese Pound, Del West Watson, Maria Neelands, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, Abraham Mohammed, Skeptic 936, Life is Short, Texas Mike, Tina Baker, David Wayne Foster, and Dank. So another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. And now I will hand over to whoever is in Discord and Google so you can enjoy their dulcet tones while I set up for today's live show. Have you guys and girls, if any, uh, read Novum Organum by Sir Francis Bacon? What? Novum Organum, or it means New Instrument by Sir Francis Bacon. No, I've never. I I don't. I'm not a book reader. Only book I've ever read is the Bible. All right. I've been reading it now. And it's kind of the foundation of the Royal Society, which I feel is one of the main influencers when it comes to science misinformation today. <clears throat> and Sir Francis Bacon was like the deity they loved. Uh, Isaac Newton and everyone but it's actually a really beautiful text it's kind of getting everyone out of being like a follower of uh, the old ancient philosophies and all that stuff and trying to revigorate science to become more experimental because the big Baconian method was pre the predecessor of the scientific method that quantum eraser is constantly talking about. You can find the PDF online if you want to read it. I highly recommend it. You can also find it on LibriVox uh, in a modern version where they where it's read like a audio book. What's the name of the book again? It's called N-O-V-U-M, Novum Organum, O-R-G-O, no, O-R-G-A-N-U-M. <clears throat> New instrument by Sir Francis Bacon. He talks about... I got it! Oh, sorry. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> yeah, I found it too. I'm downloading it now. Check it out, because he talks about what is messing with people's minds are the idols of the tribe, the idols of the cave, the idols of the market, and the idols of the theater. And that is messing with people's minds, making them worse scientists. And it's kind of... It's like purifying to read this text, but it's also very revealing because this is the method that the alchemical royal society started doing their black magic in my opinion it's like isaac newton with his gravity and he's going straight against what francis bacon was talking about i'm actually i'm gonna try to make a video about it on my youtube channel try to make it make sense 
he's talking about that science has been stagnant for over 2,000 years. We need to get rid of these old Aristotelian ideas and, you know, create a new school, focus on experiments. Right. How do we do that, though? Well, I, w I was going to say quickly, um, but what you said there sounded like they said they took one method and they replaced it with something else. So it's it's kind of like promising people freedom, but at the same time they're they're still putting people in the box. Exactly. That that's the reason why I decided to read it. I was trying to understand. <clears throat> okay, this Royal Society. These are the guys who are grafting and creating vaccinations. Hey, don't these talk are, about that. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. These are the guys that were. Um, setting up this occultic force called gravity, the motion. These are the guys that were figuring out the rainbow that comes from the prism by taking white light and changing it into the seven colors of the rainbow. Mm -hmm. And these are the, also the guys that are kind of the beginners of the bank system, being masters of the mint, like Isaac Newton. Uh, so... Like in six, this is in, this is in 1666, but Francis Bacon dies in 1621, and there are actually ideas that he became Shakespeare. He faked his own death. He became uh, many many decades older than presumed. Like Isaac Newton was trying to figure out the philosopher's stone, and the philosopher's stone is basically alchemy par excellence but it's what i found out trying to christify themselves to become jesus christ the philosopher's stone is internal it's not an external stone you create you are the philosopher's stone being following chastity uh, and then pushing the alchemy from the bottom up into the third eye and then opening it up, becoming more intelligent. But I think that's kind of anti-Christian, anti-Christ. So I think like, but Francis Bacon, I, I don't know. I, I don't trust him because many of the stuff that you can read, it's you can read it from an inspirational and you can also use it as a, guide how to control people's mind, you know. All right. So what led you to uh, this? Quantum Eraser, John, <clears throat> he was talking about the scientific method. And I saw that he was mentioning the Baconian experiment. And in this, you can pretty much, if you see uh, Nathan Oakley's uh, Paul Buster video with, with Quantum Eraser, where they're going over the scientific method, trying to expose the pseudoscientists. And Bacon, he said that the experiment is key. But you have to also create a hypothesis. And in order to create a hi hypothesis, you have to do a literal or literature review. If there's a natural phenomenon that you're witnessing, and he's telling everyone, stop following the sciences. They have lost their roots in natural philosophy, which is the mother of all sciences, according to Francis Bacon. So if you look, study a natural phenomena, there you start to take the next step, which is literal literature review. Then the next step is uh, create a hypothesis or a prediction. And then the fourth step is test an experiment. And then there are a few other steps that Quantum Eraser talks about. But in the end, that's the scientific method. And that's how you get the globers, because they're not following the scientific method in astronomy and, and geology and astrophysics 
evolution and all that stuff. It doesn't have any finding, found foundation in any truth, really. It's based on theories and ideas, which Francis Bacon was trying to eradicate. <clears throat> so that's the reason why I wanted to go into the origins of it, because I see that the Royal Society seems to be one of the main issues of our current paradigm, our current timeline. Very, very interesting. Right. And one yeah, thing that's fascinating, I, I downloaded that PDF, man. I'll be checking that out. You check it out because he was very fond of a royal physician called Gilbert, who was investigating magnetism. And he was a believer in the Copernican model and believed that the Earth was rotating around itself and was magnetically drawn to the sun. And this is before Newton was describing gravity. So I think that's just like, a, if you go to LibriVox, I can find that one. Do you know LibriVox? I do. I use it all the time. I listen to books. I just don't read them. Yeah. It's called The New Organon, or True Directions. Uh, let me see. Uh, I can't read the full title, but... Yeah, the new work on or the true directions of concerning the interpretations of uh, something. But he he talks about that Aristoteles needs to be disregarded because everybody's just blindly believing that uh, what Aristoteles was talking about. And if you read about Aristotelianism, that is basically matter... Uh, how to talk, how to articulate. Articulate comes from Aristoteles. It's like uh, breaking the bonds of the old and creating something new. But that in, in our age, what Francis Bacon is talking about is the old. So I feel like we have to do, do a catharsis, go through a purification of these old ways of handling science and revigorating science again. Making it back, go back to the roots. But Novum Organum seems to be, is it's, I went into it with very much suspicion, but it ended up being, coming kind of like a, like a foundation of something beautiful, you know? But the alchemy, this alchemical bullshit that they were following, that became Alistair Crowley, you know? That is something that is very uh, scary. But we live in a very beautiful age right now, I feel. We, we have the possibility to read all the same literature that these guys were reading, but they could only read it because they, it was all written in Latin. It was Here, just a... here's, here's what I see the main problem is, is... They know history all the way back pre-flood, and we don't know shit. We're just trying to catch up with, with no, nothing to tell us what the truth is. We're just trying to figure it out on our own. And they know. They know all the way back. They, they've got it all. Yeah. Yeah. When you open that book, it says Lord Bacon. Yeah, oh, Bacon yeah the, the Lord, eh? This was the first scientist that was knighted. Isaac Newton was the second one. 
Oh, okay, so you're saying this is like the start of that whole thing. That's what you were saying too, weren't you? Yeah, this area, this era, and I don't know if Nathan knows this, but he's an Englishman or a Welshman, so he should know his history a little bit better than me, I feel. But Oliver Cromwell killed or got uh, Charles I beheaded in 1650 or something like that. And he became the Lord Protector of the Seal and created a new reality in a way. And, and Charles II, the King Charles II, he was exiled for a few years. And then Oliver Cromwell died from natural causes and was buried in Westminster Abbey. And Charles came back, Charles II came back, and he exhumed the uh, the body of Oliver Cromwell, took him and hung him up on top of the building where uh, Charles I was uh, uh, beheaded. And left him there for the whole day and then cut his head off and left it on a spike for decades with another guy that was an accomplice of Oliver Cromwell. And then Charles II becomes the protector of the Royal Society and grants them the royal, uh, what is it called, seal. And they were always appealing to the royalty to, to be able to be funded. And they took a, like a, painted a picture of themselves or, or drew a picture of themselves. And they had a musket in, the, in that to prove that the sciences were very important for, for England. It's a very interesting, if you go into this rabbit hole, this is like the the seed of all this nonsense that we're feeling seeing today was planted then. And we are living in the branches of a huge tree. It kind of feels like Elden Ring. <laughs> you were playing that game. Elden Ring was talking about Radan, who was this gravity guy, and the royalty were grafting uh, stuff onto them. And it's kind of like... Uh, Seems to be pointing at us at to something, the Japanese gaming developers. But I highly recommend if you read all about this, you will understand the origins of the in inoculare, the grafting um, that become the vaca, which it means cow and comes from cowpox. Uh, Edward Jenner was the guy who started that all, and he did it on an eight-year-old boy. He was just, they used orphans and they used prisoners to test on. It's just crazy, you know. But it's cool. All right. Cool. Yeah, my PC is not strong enough to play, play Olden Ring right now. <laughs> Needs a new CPU. Uh, but that's one a hell of a game. It's one of the best ones I've played. Yeah, yeah. My uh, my friend has it, or my brother's friend has it. I see it used in game, gaming benchmarks quite frequently, which which was always a bit of a wonder, because it's locked at sixty frames per second anyway, isn't it? Um, it should be. It is. But you're saying your PC is no, not, not powerful enough. Okay. Well, it's no, knows. it's not. It it's it's just game. the CPU. The CPU. The CPU is really old. Then I have everything else is good, but the CPU is old. Anyway, total An older tangent. i5. Yes, you're saying Elden Ring is like that circumstance. It's, Way back when. it's fine when I do the training room, but once I get in the open world and everything opens up and you can see really far away, that's where it chugs. Fair enough. But yeah. So what did you think of the combo uh, he just shared with us, uh, Nathan? 
But the, this, uh, what do I think of the what? The conversation that happened. Yeah, very good. I was listening. Yeah. I'm a bit curious about that book now, but uh, yeah. Yeah, because we talk about it, right? We talk about the scientific method coming from the the Baconian guy, the Bacon guy. And how many people looked into it? How many people read his books and stuff like that, right? And what do you, what do you learn when you do read his books? So it kind of gave me some insight. I'm like, hey, wait a second. Maybe we should check this out a little bit. Looks like Vlad well, basic sent us a video to cover today. Tyson video or Tyson short. Why do all planets orbit in the same direction? So even Tyson agrees they go in the same direction then, right? <laughs> Tyson always debunks the Globers, man. Yeah, uh, Elvis shared that video with me, so I thought it was important. <laughs> Who remember that moment when the Globers claimed that they use uh, fi uh, fixed position uh, celestial bodies to do celestial navigation? And when you talk to them about Mount Kanigu or Sel uh, Selenelian uh, eclipse, they claim that those bodies in the sky change position dependent to uh, atmospheric condition. <laughs> so. Uh, Imagine the difference of uh, elevation angle in a selenelian eclipse. So the sun were, were meant to be under the, the horizon uh, or the, cur the globe curvature uh, would be the, the good word. And uh, it were uh, elevated to appear high above the horizon just due to the atmospheric conditions. And they still use those bodies to do celestial navigation. Are they crazy or what? Doesn't make any sense. If the light's bending around the curve of the Earth, it's going to bend around and therefore not produce a shadow on the moon. Like, oh, well, it just bends around, what, into our eyes only? <laughs> like, it can't have it both ways. <laughs> it's not called the impossible eclipse for a re You know, it's called the impossible eclipse for a reason. Exactly. And they still claim opposite things in the same word. So they claim fixed position stars and celestial bodies, but at the same time, uh, they are changing uh, position dependent to the atmospheric conditions. So uh, I never seen the sun uh, go uh, forward and then the atmosphere uh, conditions or the weather change and uh, the sun go back, uh, backward because of the atmospheric conditions. No, I never seen noon and uh, before noon. Regardless, their claims are orbital claims and their orbital claims come from derivations of measurements of the movements of the stars with their angular relationships over a flat plane. Their orbital mechanic claim requires a flat Earth. There's another video suggested by uh, Gilly Pong, who just chatted about the, that book. I'll post it in Skype once I get in Skype. It says, Brian Cox debunked the Big Bang. And it's that Sabrina person. Cool. I'll have a really? look at that too. I'll just post it. I'll let you pick what you want. Nathan, also uh, Planet Peterson oh. and uh, Bob the Science Guy made a video yesterday. Um, I made quite a few clips. Whenever you're ready. Oh, really? Okay. It was pretty hilarious. It was pretty hilarious, man. Yeah. I don't know if you want me to post them right now. Actually, yeah. I'm a little busy right now. I can do it later. No, I'll post them. But, um, we'll, do them. we'll do them when we do the live show. All right. All right. All right. So Wait. I'll need a couple. Of... What's up, Reg? You got 19 minutes until the live show, so you're good for a bit. Okay. I just need five minutes and then I'll do it right away. It'll okay. definitely be ready before the show. I've got loads of stuff coming. Great. 
Oh, and by the way, uh, Planet Peterson also spoke with another um, anti-Christian, anti-Bible guy, uh, Glober. And um, they got to the Big Bang. And again, Planet Peterson said the Big Bang was discovered by doing science. And when this guy asked him how, he said with a telescope, by observing a red shift. So Planet Peterson thinks that uh, Big Bang was discovered by doing science with the telescope, observing red shifts. Yeah, he's a moron. He's a total moron. I hate to call people names, but it's like, yeah, he's one of those guys, like, there's no help for him. Dunning-Kruger galore. Also, B said he's uh, he's going to post your videos. Seems like he got access to your videos, uh, Mighty, so he's going to post them in Skype for you. Wait, what do you mean? How? How did he? What access? Well, did you share those videos before somewhere? Maybe last night. Um, did I? No, I don't think so. It was late last night, bro. Oh, you just made them. That's man. what got me to bed so late. <laughs> like... so how many videos are you making? It seems like you got tons of they these. They were clips. Stuff, no, no. Oh, yeah. That was a practical navigator. Like, there's two clips of him talking about the Great Circle. So that was pretty hilarious, too. Um, then I posted one with... Uh, Planet Peterson's new guest. I think I might have put it in a, in a Skype too, where he shows this guy with the face tattoos and domes over Saturn and all that. But uh, yeah, the Bob the Science guy, this was literally just last night they uploaded. They made a video together. And I stayed up late making a couple of clips. So uh, yeah, just give me a few minutes. Yesterday was sure it was interesting. Yeah. Um crazy racist nutter came in up coming on. A lot of people yeah, said sorry uh, to, to jump in right away, yeah. Interesting. That guy was yeah, since the since the get go, man, there's there was something wrong with that guy. And he tried to get you from all from all angles, bro. Um, you did a great job, Nathan. You kept the cool until the end, bro. You know, the ether and then him cutting you off at every second. I knew it was going there and I was hoping somebody would mute him. But um, I was driving. That didn't happen. And um, my brother, yeah, the, the words that came out of your mouth yesterday, that shit can't happen, dude. Like, I'm sorry, man. I love you, bro. I've been supporting you forever. I'll continue to support you. I care for you. Uh, but yeah, the stuff that came out of your mouth yesterday, bro, it just can't happen, man. You sit on such intellectual pedestal, bro. That words like that shouldn't even come to your mind, let That's alone for you to speak you them. About me? What did I say? Yeah, brother, like, like you know, a couple of words that like I, I can't even repeat it, man. Like it was radar bad, our bro. content, basically, is what he's saying. Yeah. Say again, I didn't catch that. that... Rated <laughs> our content. <laughs> I didn't. You know, when you you don't understand, I, I can't repeat it, but I don't want to like like for him to stick in his tongue into your like whatever. Oh you right, what I mean? like calling him a brown nose. Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, it was, yeah. Nathan, bro, like, you're too fucking intelligent for that, bro. You understand? Like, you, there's no need. You have all the arguments, like, your verbal skills and everything, dude. Like, there's just no need for that, man. Like, like yeah, there needs to be a moderator in a room that's going to kick him out or mute him when you speak so that shit doesn't happen. But uh, you kept your composure, bro, until the end, and then it was like, oh, man. So that's just my opinion, bro. Like you're too yeah, intelligent enough. for yeah, those enough. words to come. Fair yeah. enough. Okay. I love you, brother. That's it, man. Said it, so fair enough. Yeah, man. It's actually a fairly common thing to say here, believe it or not. Clearly not. What's common to say? Get your tongue out of my ass. That's fairly common to say here. But obviously shocking to Americans, so I won't say it again. <laughs> so that, that was shocking, bro. That was kind of shocking. 
not to me. And that's I think why, other that's pe- why it flowed off my tongue so easily because it's like I say, fairly common thing to say here. If you're telling someone to stop brown nosing, <laughs> oh shit! No, not even necessarily brown nose. You like stick. I uh, I don't know. I don't even know how you said it. Like to take his, to stick his tongue into your a hole or something like that, and then you repeated it too, bro. I was like, oh my gosh, just slap my forehead. It's just, yeah, no need but for that, bro. You're too intelligent and you got all the arguments and truth is always on your side. There's just literally no need for that because that's okay, what they're looking enough. for, bro. I've he came, he came I, for that. I got you. So you got to understand that he came for that, right? No, I understand he was fishing for something. That's what he got. Yeah, exactly. Say, commonly yeah. used British slang term. But like I say, to me, that wasn't a big deal. But to you guys, obviously it was. So if that's what he came for, that's what he got. intrigued that people would go to those sorts of lengths to blag that they're on your side for such a prolonged period and know the argument so well and the only reason they're really here is to to cut you out i'm sure i said it to him in the moment but there was a point that his mask slipped you know he starts telling me what i what he really thinks of me just for a few seconds Clearly no one else picked up on that. Probably trim it out. He's not the first of his kind, is he? Let's be honest. I'm sure he won't be the last either. Hello. Again? Was it anybody famous? Was who anybody famous? The uh, the provocateur. Yeah, don't repeat his name. Alright. Was he famous? You I don't just know. Say famous or not famous? Not. I wouldn't have thought he was famous. Why? Why would you ask that? Weird question. Uh, there's a little uh, mobilization of different groups right now. Going around, doing the rounds. Tell me more. You remember, like you said, okay, I've got this conviction where I want to spread my wings and go to other places, right? Yeah. So that's an action. And the reaction is that the people who don't like you are like, oh, crap, he's on the move. I got to get on the move. Okay. So I noticed markedly that after you, you said that on your show a while back, a lot of people just started showing up like in 24-7, in the 24-7 politics, et cetera, just, you know, with the usual niche rhetoric, denominational rhetoric, you know? Wow. I had no idea I had any sort of influence in that regard. Okay. They were polishing up anti-flat earth and globe earth rhetoric. Amazing. Yep. Good. Oh, and 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 uh, let's let's just call it infighting. That's polished up too. <laughs> Tell me more. So there was a. There's a resurgence in the presence of the the not flatters or the other earthers. Gotcha. Upward rising earthers and things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there was. Yeah, yeah. Sudden resurgence and people popping their head above the parapet, so to speak. Everyone's trying to do the uh, the long form treatment style powwow videos, you know, where they just have this long video that they critique as a group. 
I, I, again, I don't know what you're talking about. Tell me more. You're full of information today. Uh, what do you mean? Like, well, you know, we we stream like in the 24-7, obviously 24-7, right? With intermittent pauses. These people will be clipping out like six, seven hour videos that sit there powwowing with them. You can imagine that's got to take way longer than the, the duration. Pretty, it's pretty uh, commitment there. They got some commitment, let's say that. <laughs> Weird. Where do you want to go tomorrow, Righteous? Should we go to the land of misfit toys? Oh, uh, where's that? I don't uh, know the Geo? server. That's just what QE calls it. I only know Geo what what at the moment. Earth Awakenings. If you want. Big an AI? Yeah, that's Earth, that's Earth Awakenings Geo server. You want to go there? Yeah, we can go there. Why not? All right. Well, uh, I'll talk to Geo and uh, he'll know about it tomorrow. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Yep. Blame QE if you don't like me going to Earth Awakenings because I wouldn't have remembered the name of it to remind myself to go well, there when not... it came up in conversation if it wasn't for QE going. Are you going to the land of misfit toys again? Well, what are you talking about? There's, there's no need to blame anybody. <laughs> Why would there be any need to blame anybody? Because had he not reminded me, I'd have probably said, let's go to 24-7 Discord, which is what AI has just re recommended or talked about, right? Well, you guys could do it, both of them. Just uh, figure out your schedule and go to both of them. Like, one day, one server, another day, another server, so. Well, I've been out to keep a track of you guys in particular for a few days, but there was a challenger from the politics 24-7 uh, Flat Earth channel called Peter the Great with his new Glowproof 2.1. He, he wants to challenge you particularly, but he wants somebody else to tell you and then you to beg him to come on his time schedule, which is kind of crazy. That sounds I told familiar. Him, Dude, just show up. <laughs> That's what they all do. <laughs> they're like, <laughs> it's like they're, they're guys that have never managed to figure out how to date girls. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what it reminds me of. Yeah. You need you need that girl to come up to me and tell me that she wants to go out with me. Yeah, that'll work. <laughs> yeah, very, very, very yeah, familiar. He was, he was holding back on us, you know, trying to say he was going to hold out for certain people before he revealed it because it was so crucially damning to the position, you know, that he has to have all the people there so it could be one fell swoop. So you want me to tell you what it was? Feel free. So here's what it was. Anti-hydrogen. So they have this little thing that's like held within like a magnetic or electromagnetic uh, flux or something that separates like hydrogen from anti-hydrogen. And then the, when they released it, there's more anti-hydrogen, quote unquote, like collected or measured on the bottom of the container then escapes out the top. Therefore, obviously, he's insinuating gravity. It's a, in his claim, gravity means ipso facto globe, that therefore, because there's more anti-hydrogen on the bottom, I've proven the Earth is a globe. That's his big globe proof. But that's presumably in response to us asking, how can you have gas pressure without a container? Right? Yeah, or, or um, gravity. Yeah, either one. Well, sure. That well, their gravity response is easily overcome. But in terms of his demonstration, if that's his demonstration, it sounded like there was a container involved. Was there not? More pressure at the bottom of the More container than at the top, or something like that. You said. Oh, this is after they released the field. So. I'm guessing the principle is that it's held in like a magnetic field or something, so that it, yeah, you know, it, that that whole contraption is within a container, but it's upon the release of it. Yeah, but you're saying there's a container that makes a magnetic field that holds the anti-hydrogen inside the field inside the container. 
correct? They release that field, what happens? No, but the, the field itself is created within a container, correct? Right. Yeah, I've seen So then you before. turn it off, right? Yeah. But he's speaking about, so, you, yeah, this is like kind of like the tackle back reactor and all that kind of stuff. But he's, his little angle is, okay, you turn off the field, and then you measure what happens with the dispersion of what's ever inside. It disperses. And so his claim is, well, when you, yeah, when you measure the dispersion, though, his claim is more goes down than up. Okay. So as it disperses, right? It's dispersing. Yeah. So it's following entropic law, exactly as you'd expect. And he's describing a manner of which it follows the entropic law. Okay. So what? It's dispersing. Am I missing something? You're missing the part where he, he says more of it can be measured coming out the bottom than the top, therefore Earth's a globe. Okay. And does it remain that way? Do we Are we floating around in pools of anti-hydrogen? Oh, no. <laughs> I don't, well, let me change that. I don't know what his claim is. Let's put it that way. Beyond what I just described. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it might not be the exact same example, but I've I've come across this before. According to what I've seen here, CERN experiment traps antimatter atoms for 1,000 seconds in 2011. A paper published online, and that's anti-hydrogen. So, for 1,000 seconds, what is that, 16 minutes? Amazing. So what? <laughs> exactly. Wait a minute. Isn't it? And? What is it? Isn't it one one thousandth of a second? Or am I wrong? Well, it says here in Geneva, 5th of June 2011, a paper published online by the journal Nature Physics Today, the Alpha experiment at CERN reports that it has succeeded in trapping antimatter atoms for over 16 minutes, long enough to oh, okay. begin to study their properties in detail. Uh, but I don't know. I think, like, this is from 2011, and they're talking about this anti-hydrogen uh, in the late 90s. So I don't know what he is talking about as a new thing. It's new. Hey, hey, good, good morning. Good morning. Such enthusiasm for a Tuesday. I don't normally mention the day, but when it's such high enthusiasm levels, we did a full warm up in the pre show. Let's try that again. Welcome, one and all. Yo, yo, good morning. Hey, hey. Hey. I like it. <laughs> Any scientific evidence of gravity? Gravity, what's that? 109 year out of date mass attracting mass or. 109 years till now, pretty much, if you ignore quantum mechanics, pseudo-Romanian space-time bending, fourth-dimensional gravity from Einstein. So no cause and effect relationship then, so not science then? I mean, you can scientifically validate specific gravity, but that's just relative density disequilibrium explanations, which can be scientifically validated. But mass attracting mass was superseded by fourth dimensional pseudo space time. Those are the current rhetorics for keeping gas around a sphere Earth in a sky vacuum in violation of natural law, in spite of the fact that neither of those would actually, well, in the first instance, mass doesn't attract mass, so it's immediately violated by how gas behaves because it's not attracting itself in any way, shape, or form. It has elastic collisions. So that overrides the already superseded 109 year out of date newtonian in name only gravity but then you've got a convoluted gaggle screw nonsense of bent pseudo romanian for space time with geodesics to give rise to a gerrymandering of the forces that we don't experience by scale so saying that we have one g acting on us when we're just sat doing nothing and the zero g acting on us 
when you're in a perpetual orbital motion derived from flat plane measurements. Hope that answers your question. Hello, John. Hello. Hello. Any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics? Not at all. Those are pseudosciences. Uh, no, they don't uh, have any scientific proof of anything. Just observations. Is it Gil Pong, am I saying your name correctly? He's giving us a, a talk in the... Go ahead. Gilly Pong, yeah. Gilly Pong. That's pretty much close. If you're a member, check out the pre-show where Gilly Pong was going through his research, if you want to call it that, into Francis Bacon. And specifically, the aspect that we touch on is the scientific method. So check that out. Get a book recommendation out of him as well. So yeah, that'll get published as soon as the live show finishes. Now, should really ask this question. Any evidence of axial rotation of the Earth-based variety? Don't all go at once. I'm going to need a flat plane uh, and a radius value in order to come to that conclusion. Indeed we will. Maybe we'll cover that in a minute with Tyson. So uh, you know the drill if you're a frequent flyer. That is to say, let Neil deGrasse Tyson or whoever the videographer is in this instance know. At Nathan Oakley 1980 sent me. There is a link to the video that we're about to cover going by in the live stream. So hopefully, if we were to ever get a response from some of these people, they would put a link to our video, this video, to help us in the YouTube algorithm where we receive none. All the planets orbit in the same direction around the sun. Well, this question has been with us for centuries. And it wasn't until the mid 1700s where you'd already established the movements with respect to their angular relationships on a flat plane at this point. An idea was put forth by Laplace who suggested that maybe they formed from a disk of gas that was swirling around the sun. So perhaps it was a second law of thermodynamics violation, gas swirling around, not dispersing into areas of volume in line with entropic law. Perhaps that's what it was. So whatever you make out of that disk... What disk? This disk that he's fantasized into reality? Because it doesn't exist. It also violates a law of nature. But now we've got a disk in space from gas. Right, Tyson? Because one man postulated it. This is the world we live in, isn't it? One man says, maybe it's this. Next thing you know, it's that. And we're talking about it. As you absorb up the remaining gas, whatever... Sorry, absorb up gas? What? What's absorbing up gas now? Gas disperses in all directions, all vectors, in line with entropic law to fill whatever volume it's got. Meanwhile, let's just make up a fantasy story about what gases do out in outer space. Whatever you make is going to have the motion that the... Is it? Why? The what? The motion of orbits? The orbital motions described from measurements taken from a flat plane. I've already covered this. Making it absurd when you reify it into motions around a sphere Earth or around the sun in this instance. ...original gas had. And that way you get all the planets orbiting in the same direction in approximately the same plane. We see the formation of... Is that it? No, there's more. ...planets around other stars. Just a heavy edit. Fair enough. This is a shorts video. And they're making disks. So we have... That's all right. They need. There's a correlation transformed into causation. Go ahead. But he, he invoked the plane there. Now, he's not talking about the Earth. As, well, he is talking about the planet as a disk that forms into a planet. But they need a plane to describe the angles for the orbits. That's why they use an ecliptic plane. Right. The derivation of an orbit is has its genesis in flat Earth measurements. That's correct. Independent evidence of what likely happened at the beginning of our own solar system. No, you don't have a time machine. You don't have a DeLorean. So offering me up so-called evidence of what happened at the beginning of time will merely be you reifying bent geodesics in space-time to claim that when you look through a telescope, you're looking back in history. Yeah, that's all this is. So, yeah. 
Good question. So no. Now works. Great question. Shame it needed flat Earth to answer it. What's that? We're in an orbital motion after deriving flat Earth measurements. And therefore, we've got disks of gas violating natural laws. It's utterly absurd. This whole rhetoric, this whole heliocentric nonsense rhetoric. It's just absurd. That was it. That was the whole shorts video from Tyson. Also got another one. The three broadband winter set is from Sabine Hosselenfelder. Just get this sized up before I take her off mute and rewind her. Oh, why does this look so terrible? There we go. Beautiful. Happened before the Big Bang. I got this question on Twitter and thought, well, the answer is that we don't know. Now, I'm quite fond of short videos, but that's a little too short even for my taste. Then I saw that Brian Cox has supposedly debunked the Big Bang with a creation story, and I thought... Uh, so there's nothing to debunk. You don't debunk stories with stories. I'm not going to say that Star Wars debunks Narnia. Because, I mean, I could. Star Wars comes along and is a different story to the history of Narnia. Completely different lore. Therefore, Narnia debunked with Star Wars. No. Lemaitre's ideas of what happened at the Big Bang are merely, like with the other video we just covered with Tyson, just his ideas. What he says does not go and does not require any sort of debunking. It hasn't been proven in the first instance to assert that we need to debunk it, but this just puts it into a false dichotomy away from the begging the question fallacy story that is the origination of the Big Bang by Lemaitre. So if you can put it in false dichotomy where one man saying he's debunked a story. It's like, well, one of them's got to be true. No. <laughs> Complete false dichotomy. Whatever Cox says versus whatever Lemaitre says, the truth will out. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> He-Man versus Thundercats. Whoever proves their story most true. <laughs> what the hell? What, what kind of world do we live in? This is bonkers. Thought he did what? Then I watched the clip that's narrated by Brian Cox, and I think I know what happened there. Let me explain. He came up with a just-so story, just like the Matre about the Big Bang did, and then he offered it up in false dichotomy, juxtaposing it with the original Big Bang story versus his version of his story. And you're going to now pick those two stories apart? Yeah, why are we doing this? Who picked this video? Is it you, Righteous? No. You posted it. <laughs> My fault. Sorry. I, mean, I, I like to moan. It doesn't mean I'm actually moaning at you. You've got, you'll get the vibe eventually. Me saying, I hate this, is because actually I love it and it's giving me a good reaction to put out to the audience. But if I don't disclaim that, it does, strictly speaking, ruin the magic for the audience. But so you know, I'm not telling you off. When I say, I hate this, it doesn't necessarily mean it's so. It means I love to hate it rather than I hate you for posting it. Does that make sense? Makes sense, man. Perfect. <laughs> This is an outrage. <laughs> Let's juxtapose He-Man with Thundercats and see which one wins. Observations tell us that the universe expands. Really? Why? If we use those observations and take the equations that Einstein gave us... Uh, sorry, if we take observations and then utilise maths as an explanation for it. I see. No, no, you can qualify and describe things with mathematics, but they're not going to give you any explanations. Let's just get that clear right off the bat. We can calculate what happened in the distance. No, you can't. Yeah, you're not going back in time. We've already covered this already as well. Nobody's going back in time to tell us the beginnings of our existence. In order to do so, you would have to rewind the arrow of time, which is precisely what they're inferring they're doing, by whatever means they infer that they can do it. Nevertheless, you cannot rewind entropy. The arrow of time moves in one direction, and to assert that you can rewind the arrow of time to the beginnings of time will only lead you to one question. Did nature create us, or was there an external entity? That is known as the ontological primitives. That is where this question leads you. Now, they don't want you to know that, so what they're going to do is offer you up He-Man versus Thundercats and ask you which one seems more real. That's what they're actually going to do past since the universe expands in the past oh, so, so we've decided it does expand baseless assertion with absolutely no evidence to back it but, but universe expands does it 
So this light show in the sky is expanding, is it? Expanding into what? How is it expanding? Oh, we can give you the maths for how we describe what we see through our telescopes. Therefore, it's expanding. Look at my description of it expanding. In physical terms, it's getting bigger. Past matter must have been more concentrated. Indeed, if we trace the equations back, then the density of matter just increases and increases until it's infinitely large. See? Yeah, this is pure inference. Right, you can see what happens when entropy goes forward. Therefore, by inference, you can describe what would happen if you rewound time. Yeah, again, I'm so ahead of this. This infinite density happens at a finite time of about 13.8 billion years. Sorry, when you say a finite amount of time, what, is this the fourth dimensional space time that you'll be utilising later to describe gravity? Or is it just the time that we experience our known existence in as a qualification that we all know and love? Which one is it? We're talking bent geodesics here? Sounds like we've got an equivocation problem. And it's what we usually refer to as the Big Bang. Is it? I don't. Le Maitre did. Now you have decided that's true. So therefore we all refer to it as Big Bang. No, you're Christ you're, I was about to say Christian. Your heliocentric religion infers that this is the origin story because a man came up with a story about it. Mathematically, this Big Bang is a singularity in several measurable quantities. Mathematically, it's a singularity. It's a good job we don't experience in conceptual mathematics isn't it because that's not physics so when you start moving from the physical mm, let's just be a little bit more careful about what i say the reified physical based on lemaitre stories into the mathematical we're going from the reified non-physical into the conceptual non-physical to tell you how the world is how dare you you're poison sabine you're poison like the energy density of matter, but also the curvature of space-time. Oh, sorry, what? This is now going to have the equivocation I called about 25 seconds ago. Now we've got Ben Geodesic called it. The first relevant thing to note is that it doesn't mean there wasn't anything before the Big Bang. It Does it not? How the hell would you know? So now she knows, based on inference, through mathematical derivations, rewinding the arrow of time. Now you know whether or not there is anything before the beginning of the time that you didn't see when you rewound the arrow of time through inference and mathematics. This is an outrage. I shouldn't be able to unpack it. It's just that if there was something before the Big Bang, it isn't in any way connected to what happened after. How so the hell do you know? I'm not saying that's wrong or right. You just don't know. So we'd never know of it. So why are you making any inference if you're going to disclaim straight after that garbage that you just wouldn't know? Yeah, like I did while you were saying it. But you're still saying it, aren't you, love? Like it's got some merit? It hasn't. Like you just disclaimed, you just wouldn't know, would you? Yeah, like I said as you were babbling out your nonsense. Do you see what I mean? Take a super simple example of a singularity that... What, what the singularity that only exists in the mathematical conception that you just invented? Should I take... Well, how do I do that? How am I going to take this concept within the mathematics into the physical? Can you tell me how I do that first so I can physically do this? So me as a researcher can manipulate something. Oh, what's this? Is this a graph? I don't think I'm going to be able to capably physically manipulate a singularity. I think you're just making this garbage up by reification and mathematical conception. In fact, that's exactly what you're doing. In the function 1 over x squared when x goes to zero. It's not like there's no curve for x smaller than zero. It's just that there's no connection between the two parts. And this isn't physics. The same could be the case for the Big Bang thing. It could, but I've just said it isn't physics. So now you're going to connect it to what you described by Lemaitre's story as a physical story of our physical beginnings where nature poofed itself into existence, a violation of the first law of thermodynamics. No, I'm not going to accept it. It violates natural law. Singularity. There was something before it, but it's not in any way connected to us, so we'd never... Because, by pure fiat, you say so. You couldn't know, but now you know. And you're going to tell us that that's what you know, and therefore that's how it is. What an outrage! Literally 30 seconds ago on this video, you disclaimed that you just couldn't know. No. That said, most physicists don't think that the singularity is even there to begin with. Again, so why are we even postulating it? Not that they know either. They're making it up too. So I wouldn't take their, I don't think it's that way either. Like I wouldn't take Brian Cox's juxtaposition in false dichotomy like it has any merit either. None of this has any merit. We're in complete la-la land. 
Does anybody think that this is what they live in? Yeah? Because this is not a bent geodesic in 4D space time, but that's what they're alluding to. Yeah? That your visualization of a bent geodesic in 4D space time on a 2D picture of a 3D rendering with no fourth dimension in it whatsoever, it's just a pretty picture. This is what's used to sell us on the total nonsense garbage that she reified through mathematical conventions. I mean, it's, this is just outrageous. I hate it. Good video. Who picked this? That's because in all other cases, well, we have a singularity in the physical... Do we? We have a singularity in visible, measurable quantities now. What the hell? No, we do not. A measurable quantity... It just means that the theory breaks down and we need to use a better one. I see. So the fact that we don't have anything to back for this in physics means we just need a better quote unquote theory. Yeah, hijacking the terms of science, though, aren't you, love? Because theories are based on scientific evidence and this doesn't have any, does it? None. But we need a better theory. What, you mean a better just so story? Is no one else outraged by this? More so than Tyson. This is absolutely infuriating. No, nope, nobody gives a crap. Fair enough. A good example is hydrodynamics that describes how liquids behave. Surfaces of drops can have points with infinite curvature, like... Roll on the false equivalence. So, a three-dimensional water drop has curvature, therefore bent geodesics in space-time and singularities. No, it's just a false equivalence. When a drop of water pinches off a tap, that pinch-off point... Has that got a bent geodesic in space-time? Yeah, that little drop. Is it? Is it a singularity in the bent geodesic in the fourth dimensional realm? Where's the fourth dimension? Your pretty picture had one. It didn't. It was hijacking one of the already in existence third dimensions in this instance. There isn't any fourth dimension even being eluded by hijacking a third dimension. So where's the fourth dimension? There isn't one. A minute ago we had bent geodesics and now you're pointing at the end of a tap and telling me it's so. Point is the singularity. Is it? So this is your proof for the singularity, is it? Anybody else buying this? Does anybody else watch a tap dripping and go, yeah, 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 Einsteinian fourth dimensional bent geodesic in space time causing a singularity? No. But of course, if you look at the drop on the scale of a single atom, there's nothing singular about it. It's just so it doesn't even stack up in false equivalence, really. Just that if we approximate all those atoms with a smooth fluid, that those singularities appear. If we approximate it. There are consequences of this approximation. That the consequences of approximations. If I give you an approximation for how many gumballs there are in something, it has no consequence on the amount of gumballs that are in there. By approximation, there's 100. No, there's 4,000. Oh, uh, well, it's an approximation. It created a singularity. Bent geodesics. Are you nuts? This is garbage, woman. That's why physicists think. N no, no, no. Physicists would be performing physics. That's the study of the physical, physical physics, physical and natural world. That's natural science. Now, physicists would be varying and manipulating things in actual reality, independent variables. And they have to fit a certain criteria. That is to say, first and foremost, they're real. You know, and capable of being varied and manipulated. And you're independent variable in a hypothesis. That's what physicists... Oh, my bad. That's not what really you're talking about now, is it? You're talking about pseudoscience pretender clowns who make up stories. Like Cox. And Lemaitre. The Big Bang singularity just tells us that we need a better... Doesn't tell us anything. It's not an entity, it's a reification. It's a story. Now it's got lungs and lips and it's telling us things from what, the beginning of time that we haven't been to? Did someone travel back in the DeLorean and speak to the singularity for it to tell us stuff? No, love. This is a long gaggle screw of convolution. It doesn't have any validity in physical reality whatsoever. Yet we're talking to singularities at the moment. A theory. We don't have that theory, so the smart thing to do would be to just leave it. So she, again, it seems that every three minutes she disclaims that she's got nothing. Do, do you think that it's somehow reasonable to go through constant gibberish nonsense and at the end disclaim that that means you've basically got nothing to go on? 
But oh no, we've got a new theory coming along. So let's talk about that for ages and disclaim three minutes later that we got nothing. I hope the audience, I'm going to look at the chat in a minute, is getting a, a good idea of why this is so infuriating for me. Even at that. But of course, that's no fun. So physicists have come up with a lot of speculations for what might have happened instead of a big... Is that what physicists do? The purveyors of the study of the physical and natural world come up with speculations for what might have happened. No, you see, what they do is they have a speculation about what physically might cause something else to happen. And then they physically vary it to see if it does or not. They validate it through an experiment. That's what physicists do. But not in this bullshit world. That we all inhabit. Nah, this sums up what she has hijacked and what all of her colleagues and cohorts have also hijacked and called science. A lot of speculations for what might have happened instead of a Big Bang singularity. Because the Big, big Bang singularity's got absolutely no validity whatsoever. So our quote unquote physicists will come up with a lot of speculations. How useful is that? No, real science is validating cause and effect relationships through systematic experimentation based on validated hypothesis. Then you can form theories, not speculations, not just so stories, not regurgitation of the priesthood's rhetoric about the Big Bang. Big Bang singularity. And there's very little data in the way of their speculations. They so garbage. Not even three minutes after the last one. Young galaxies that the Webb telescope sees... Young? I bet, again, we seem to have an equivocation problem. Are we talking young in terms of the time that we describe our existence and travel through the known universe? Something we are all familiar with? The time that we look at when we look at a clock, having quantified by an arbitrary construct how we describe that process? <clears throat> Excuse me. Or are we talking bent geodesics? Because we've got a major equivocation problem going on with this woman. Young telescopes, yeah, young stars looked at through telescopes. What young? Bent geodesic young. These were probably created a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. Probably. Probably made. I mean, maybe it could be 1500 million years. I mean, it's only a probably, it's just a guess, it's a just so story and we haven't got any validity for it. And looking at this stuff doesn't really tell us much either. But 900 million years for sure. Absolutely, without question. Maybe we don't know, and I'll disclaim in three minutes' time that we've got no idea about what we're babbling about in this instance. But there it is on screen. She knows. She's happy to declare it and disclaim that she doesn't know later. The cosmic microwave background was created approximately... Insert bullshit here. 300,000 years after... We don't know. We haven't got much to go on, but definitely 300,000 years the Big later. Bang. And we have no observations from earlier on. We don't have observations. One more time. Do you know how they measured the cosmic microwave background? It's going to be with an angle. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, with respect to sea level. Are you telling us that the CMB requires a flat Earth? Yeah, if you want to measure the angle of incident and its return to the surface of Earth, yeah, it needs a flat plane. Earth to be a flat plane. Measurements of the CMB come from a flat plane. This is a flat earth proof, Sabine. Were you unaware? I think we need to let her know. That's Nathan Oakley, 1980 sent me. Go and let Sabine Hosselenfelder know. It's at the 3 minute 26 mark. If you want to timestamp it for her, say measurements of the cosmic background radiation, cosmic background radiation, require a flat earth to measure. At Nathan Oakley, 1980 sent me. Let her know. Link to her chat's going by right now in our live chat. Hopefully we'd get a link to our video were she to make a response and challenge us. Oh no, au contraire, the micro background radiation was not measured with respect to a flat Earth. How dare you? Here's my sphere Earth measurements. Yeah, and if she did offer up said sphere Earth measurements, we'd point out how they came from a flat plane too. Physicists have used particle colliders to study what highly compressed matter does. No. Men in white coats have spent billions on smashing stuff together like they've been doing for quite a significant amount of time. 
Particle colliders have existed long before CERN existed. Having a massive one doesn't make this any more science-y. There is no cause and effect relationships being studied at CERN. This isn't science. And we can use this data to extrapolate back to somewhat before the creation of the cosmic microwave background. No, you can't. Otherwise, you wouldn't have disclaimed, what, two and a half minutes earlier that you couldn't do exactly that. You can't rewind time. But that's what they're alluding to, isn't it, here? If you're Dumbo and you listen to this crap and you don't really read between the lines of what she's actually saying, you would infer now that this thing is giving you a means to travel back in time. So essentially, she's given the impression to her audience that CERN is a freaking time machine. To around the time when the Higgs field condensed, but this still doesn't get us anywhere near the Big Bang. This is why in theoretical physics, you find- In, in what now? Theoretical physics, AKA bullshit, shows up a load of maths on screen. This isn't physical, my love. Many alternative ideas for the beginning of the universe. I see. So uh, the CERN giving us answers is just actually, what, affirming the just-so stories that have come from the quasi-physicists? Yeah, we know. None of this is science. Depending on how you change the equations, because... Y you think that our understanding of the beginning of time is based on how you change equations? No. No, non-physical conceptual mathematics has no bearing whatsoever on physical reality ever. At best, it can attempt to describe it with language. That's maths. It's a language. Because there's new data to tell those ideas apart. New, new data to tell us about ideas of how things happened in the past prior to the data coming in. Do we get the data from the DeLorean? And this brings me back to Brian Cox's supposed debunking of the Big Bang. It was never proven. You can't debunk something that was never proven. It's just a way of popping it into the rhetoric and false dichotomy. In this clip from the BBC, he's clearly talking about the currently most popular theory for what happened before the Big Bang. Theories in science are validated by systematic experimentation based on hypothesis after observing natural phenomena and supposing the cause to go on to vary it and see if it causes it. If it does, you can form theory. But we've got the, what, most popular theories. This isn't a race between men and their just-so stories. But to the untrained ear, this sounds like justified science because it's, what, a theory from the physicists? It all sounds very sciencey to the untrained ear, does it not? This is how they con you. Bang. It's called eternal inflation. In eternal inflation, the creation... It's a just-so story made up idea that has absolutely no validity in physical reality of our universe is not singular. So strictly speaking, there isn't any bang. According to this theory, our universe is created by a quantum fluctuation in a field. I've got to throw some quantum words in there. This won't have anything to do with actual scientifically validated quantum mechanics. But if you just so stories got some nice science words in there, then the general public will think that you've validated this with systematic experimentation to offer proof. Because most of the general numpty public believe that you mean proof every single time you say a science word. That means it's proven. ...field called the inflaton. The inflaton creates this fluctuation and that creates a bubble which then rapidly inflates, hence the name. At some point... Hence the name and backed by science in what form? Beyond the just-so story made up by a man. Where's the validation for this? point the inflation stops and all the energy from the inflaton field is converted into matter. So where do we see this field for us to validate its cause? That would be to say naturally observed phenomena is the first step into the scientific method. This is nonsense made up just so stories. Now I'm sure you can build a multi-billion dollar experiment after the fact to validate this just so story, right? I mean, we've got a bent geodesic time machine in the former CERN, haven't we? All the matter around us is created only at that point when the inflaton field dumps its energy. The inflaton field is made up. In the literature, this event is usually referred to as reheating. What happened with Brian Cox's... Ex what event? They haven't validated any of this crap. Go ahead, whoever that was in G+. Or was it just someone hot-miking?
Eli, I'm looking at you. Explanation is that he made it sound as if the reheating is the Big Bang. I mean, listen to it yourself. We will, Sabine, we will, right after these break. As inflation ended, the ocean of energy was converted into matter. Then the Big Bang. Was it? Says who? Lemaitre? So basically, he just used the word Big Bang for something completely different. And Big Bang was invented by a man who just decided to come up with a just-so story to explain something that was unexplainable. You know, trying to come up with an explanation for the second law of thermodynamics is really what this all boils down to. And you'll never do it. You'll never explain entropy. It's somewhat of a disease among science communicators that are... Science communicators, as opposed to people varying and manipulating that which they assume causes an effect they observed in nature and wanted to study to advance humanity. I've complained about before because Have it you? Did, did you write a letter to the BBC moaning about Cox? Oh, this guy's outrageous. Challenging just so stories by utilising aspects of the just so story to say the just so story's wrong. How dare he? I'm sure it'll get on right to reply, my love. Causes a lot of confusion, but let me not go there again. Maybe more importantly, even... You could just stop making up just so stories to try and explain entropy. Maybe you could, that would be more importantly. Leaving aside that we don't know whether eternal inflation is even correct. <laughs> There's that disclaimer about three minutes after the last one. <laughs> we just don't know. <laughs> right on cue. It doesn't remove the Big Bang per se. It remove it? It hasn't been validated. How many times have I got to say it? Yeah, that's all this is for, though, isn't it? Saying that Cox's inclusion of Big Bang, which essentially doesn't challenge it in any way, he's utilising aspects of it. But this doesn't debunk it. So now we're in a position where Brian Cox's use of a Big Bang explanation within his own rhetoric, which basically will probably be exactly the same, but claimed to be challenging the Big Bang, doesn't challenge the Big Bang. Therefore, what? Affirming it as being validated in the mind's eye of numpties it's never been proven this is just a false dichotomy setup pathetic it just removes the big bang in our universe oh really we never had one in our universe love we never around the arrow of time to find out that it was true it wasn't true it was made up by a man you see in eternal inflation there are infinitely many we don't see that now you're talking in language that's past tense like we've done this any of those quantum fluctuations and each gives rise to a new universe. No, it doesn't. We're just making this stuff up. This entire multiverse of eternal inflation, however... We don't have any multiverses. Now, this is all garbage. Again, derived from Einsteinian fourth dimensional pseudo-Romanian space-time bending. An evolution of that is extra dimensions. We don't have any. This is all garbage. <laughs> Why am I even worried? I'm sure in three minutes she'll tell you that if she doesn't have any proof or evidence of this. Why am I even bothering to interject? She'll tell you herself in two minutes. But ...must also have had a beginning at finite time. And then you can ask, well, what happened before that? So he turned... Fi finite bent geodesics in space-time from Einsteinian hijacking of three-dimensional reality into fourth-dimensional pseudoscience or time like the existence that we experience in our known universe. As in the elapse of time as we would know it looking at a clock. Or is it a bent geodesic? Again, we've got this problem with equivocation here, haven't we? Inflation just moves the problem elsewhere. And of course, there are other ideas for the beginning of our universe besides eternal inflation. Other ideas, you say? So, man, there's loads of ideas. Maybe none of them are real. For example, there's the idea of a big bounce in which there was an earlier phase of the universe which... There's the big plop. There's the big poo. There's all sorts of them. Contracted. Matter became very dense, but not infinitely so, and now it's expanding. Uh, because man said so in just so story. Again, if those bounces repeat, it's called a cyclic universe. You what bounces? How would they be repeating? When did we see the first one? Where is the observed phenomena? Answer to all, we don't have one. There isn't any, we haven't seen it. You can also just push the Big Bang all the way back to minus infinity and say that for half of infinity, very little happened and then the universe suddenly started expanding. So infinitely regress 
time as we know we elapse through our own existence or time as in a bent geodesic in space time einsteinian fourth dimensional pseudo reality again it's constant equivocation it's not a very popular idea probably because the entire because it's total nonsense and made up like all the other ones including the matrix big bang point is that it's infinitely lame. Or there's the Hartle Hawking no boundary proposal that says before the Big Bang, there was no space time. There was just a four dimension. There is no space time now. So before the Big Bang, there was no Einsteinian invented 109 years ago, superseding Newtonian mass attracting mass gravity bent space time. Maybe before the Big Bang, there was no existence of invented by Einstein space time. Yeah, I could say that 109 years ago, couldn't I? But what, before the existence of the Big Bang that hasn't been validated, there was no fourth dimensional bent space time? Wow, profound. It isn't real either. Dimensional space, and then one direction of that space turned to time. The oh, back to the actual bent geodesic in space time, time now, as opposed to what we look at on a clock when we experience our journey through the known existence that we experience. I see. So we're back to bent geodesics in space time, but they're not existing prior to the Big Bang that the Maitre invented with the Just So Story. Wow, how profound. Also complete nonsense, total and utter garbage made up by men. These ideas are all more or less... Comp more or less just ideas. ...compatible with observations because you can... All ...compatible with, as opposed to explanations for or validation or proof for anything. Just merely correlated with some of the stuff we look at through our telescopes. Yeah, that's exactly what they are. Mere correlations that happen to be compatible with observations. Always make sure that the deviations from Einstein's equations are unmeasurably small. His equations are jack in terms of their meaning because they are a pseudo-geometry that you as a clown reify into your existence when equivocating between his bent geodesics and what we call time. This doesn't mean these ideas are wrong. It's that we can't... It's just that we can't validate it, right? Oh, whether they're right or wrong. <laughs> I knew it. I called it every time. So we just don't know. So we can just discount every single word you just said as being made up nonsense, as I disclaimed it as you were saying it, because you've now validated that which I critiqued. You just can't tell if it's right or wrong. Yeah, so it definitely isn't right and definitely isn't proven. All of it. None of it's proven. None of it's right. Yeah. But it might not be right. It might not be wrong. Yeah, well, you better get on with proving that crap then, are not you? Because otherwise I'm not going to accept it as being anything that's worthy of my time. So what happened before the Big Bang? First you don't know. And there was no Big Bang. But suddenly we're deciding what happened before it because you've already decided it's true. Because a man called Lemaitre made it up. Yeah, we're not going to question what happened before C.S. Lewis came up with Narnia. What was pre-Narnia? Physicists <laughs> have a lot of speculations, but the short yeah, I bet you do. Yeah, yeah. answer is that we don't know. And since... No, you don't, do you? <laughs> oh, this gets better and better. There's so little information left over from whatever happened. Billions spent on CERN. So little information. We might never know. So... <laughs> Everybody who invested in CERN. We might never know. We spent absolute shit on it, but we might never know. We just accept that. Meanwhile, there's a giant kaleidoscope that we're going to build. It's going to cost $17 billion. Who's in? We might explain the beginnings of the universe with it. I mean, we might not know at the end of it, but we might not know that we might not know. So we might know. You never know. <laughs> It's not like Brian Cox said something wrong. It's just that communication... It's just that none of you have validated any of this garbage. Communication is difficult, which is why... Yeah, I talking about stuff you've made up's hard when you can't validate it whatsoever. Meanwhile, what science does is benefit humanity. You know, the advancement in things like quantum mechanics has brought us computing. Semiconductors have advanced humanity. And why do we have them? Well, because we went through the scientific method to validate cause and effect relationships when studying light. Isn't that wonderful how science has advanced humanity to give us the technology that's enabled you to spew this garbage to audiences and propagandise them?
how wonderful science is to give you the facility to do this. I always try to learn a few words in the local language when I'm traveling. As I've mentioned before, we're planning to go to Paris and I've been learning some French with Babel, who've been sponsoring this video. I've made some progress. Je parle un petit yeah, peu français. For example, for example, so going to we live happy. Okay, any comments? As I did most of the commentary, if not all of it. Well, navigate to Paris. I wonder how she's going to get there. She'll need a flat plane for that. And if she gets lost, she might use the age-old celestial navigation method of measuring angles off a of flat Earth. Or maybe she'll use GPS and get there using the Mercator projection of a globe that was made using angle measurements taken off a of flat plane to Polaris to give you a grid system to convert onto a ball to roll out into a cylinder that you're going to make into a flat map that's called the Mercator projection used in GPS. GPS has an origin in flat earth measurements of the stars. That's probably how she'd get there. Oh, yeah, that is how she would get there. Her trip to France proves us flat. Very good. Please let Sabine Hosselenfeld and Nathan Oakley 1980 sent me. I will stick another link in the, uh, in the chat right now while we're discussing it. Yeah, I just want to give a quick shout out to Elvis for finding and sharing the Tyson video. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we've got more to do. So this is I go to... trimmed out by Vlad. And it is Bob, the science guy, and Planet Peterson discussing measuring curvature in his backyard. Get you, get you a popcorn, fellas. Get you a popcorn. I decided I really wasn't going to do any debunking. So what you will see over here is me dissecting the arguments, and you will also see me doing the science that allows you to actually debunk these things. And, you know, like, I do it my... But doing science to debunk these things. So establishing cause and effect relationships based on systematic experimentation after observing natural phenomena and asking, I wonder why that happened. You think you're going to be doing that, do you, Bob? I doubt it. Myself. I've personally measured the curvature of the Earth in my backyard. Measure? Like maths. So if you're measuring things, that's maths, not science. Immediately, you're in a category error. We'll see how you claim to have measured curvature. I have a half-mile-long lake. I've measured the rotation of the Earth. All right, where did you measure it? What, what, you're just claiming it as a baseless assertion. Um, well, well, he has I'm going a to be doing a long lake that's, that's level. So... It's not starting off real well. If it's a lake, then it's a level lake. Going Earth, Moon, Earth bounces to measure the distance uh, to the moon. Sorry, Earth, Moon bounces requires return angles, doesn't it? Absolutely, it does. You know, if he tries to depict it north of the uh, side on, he'll, he'll have to use a flat Earth to describe it. Your moon bounce to prove a flat Earth, Bob. You'll need a return angle off a flat plane. Uh, using ham radio tonight, I tracked the ISS and verified its position and speed. You know, these are things that I can do. I'm capable of doing here. And that guy decided. I OK, moving on. You've been the target of flat earthers. I, I didn't even realize this, yep. but there are a couple. Has he? I've been targeted by flat earthers. How so? A couple of flat earthers that have been making videos about me on YouTube for months, and I, I had no idea until only a couple of weeks ago. Why are you smiling about it? Oh, yeah, all the time. Um, not only have they made videos, uh, they've threatened to have me shot. Oh, yeah, yeah. Outrageous. I've been... I, uh, they've tried to... You know, they've tried to dox me. They've Yeah, it happens when you're a YouTube personality, Bob. That's just the way it goes. Publish my office and home address. Yeah, people have done that to me too. Wow. You know, things like that. This is the type of community you're dealing with. These are the... Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Bob. Yeah, scummy community. The trolls are trolls. I mean, that's not really the community, though. That's a stereotyping fallacy. In the same way you've had this, I've had this. I wouldn't put it on you, though, Bob. You know, maybe you'll stereotype all flat earthers with this now. We'll see. Type of people. Yeah. So they're... when you destroy them, 
You destroy them, they strike out like petulant, uh, petulant children. Oh, so by the same standard, me getting doxxed means that you on the globe side are striking out like petulant children? That's just stereotyping fallacy, Bob. Yeah? Because you've been doxxed by bad people doesn't mean that all of the category you're going to bundle them in with are bad. Likewise, I wouldn't put it on you that you've doxxed me because I have been doxxed many times, Bob. Yeah? But that's not you. That's not you being a globe believer. Yeah? Stereotyping fallacy. Yeah, they're not. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of fun. <laughs> um, are... Anyone want to add something to that? He doesn't think the Earth is flat. And I, I kind of, yeah. I've listened to very little of him because I, I don't have the, the patience and I, I don't care. But from what I've heard, he really sounds like somebody that doesn't believe what he's saying. Oh, of course he doesn't. Do you know uh, Ranty Flat Earth? No. Oh, Ranty was a really big flat earther. Again, sorry. Did they just mention you by name at the beginning of the... Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Oh, I was about didn't catch that. Was that me they were talking about? Oh, I didn't catch yes. that. Yes. Yep. We'll listen again at the end. Made a lot of videos and such that had a come to Jesus moment and, and realized that this was all crap. He was in the inner circle there. And, you know, he came on out and said, these guys, you know, he's, he's talked about it. These guys know full well the earth isn't flat. It's a, you know, Nathan Oakley is a trained actor. You know that, right? That's, That's true. That is true. That was what his degree in was theater. Mm. I, I don't know very much about him, but yeah. Yeah, he's a voice actor in the UK. I was never a voice actor in the UK. I trained in performing arts. And, you know, he's trained in theater. Oh, man. Performing arts. He's got a, but, you I know, can't this stand is... listening to him. The fact that he's a voice actor, that's... And why do you listen? <laughs> I can't stand listening to him. Yeah, don't listen. <laughs> why listen, then? <laughs> that's fair. <clears throat> and yet you're smiling about it. Maybe you're lying. <laughs> Who knows? Moving on. Oh, yeah, I said I played the beginning of that, didn't I? Yeah. He doesn't think the Earth is flat. And I, I kind of... Yeah. I've listened to very... Yeah, your clip just missed it off, but I'll take your word for it. You know, the fourth daddy's kind of come up with the ideas like this big thing about, you know, quantum eraser and his, uh, we have to use my scientific method or else it's not, it's pseudoscience. But his scientific method. So when we discussed in the pre-show, it dating back to Francis Bacon, that's QE's scientific method, is it? Just pure coincidence that we're discussing that in the pre-show. <laughs> I love it. I'm sure he'd take the uh, the stolen valor that he hasn't requested, but it definitely isn't quantum erasers scientific method. It's just the scientific method. He's the one that developed that. <laughs> wow. Well, QE, you learn something new every day. When we were discussing Francis Bacon, there was me thinking I had bacon. It must have been quantum eraser. Yeah, that's just my hearing. <laughs> Uh, Nathan Oakley is another one. Uh, uh, Austin Witt. You know, the fourth daddy's kind of come up with the ideas like the Fourth daddies? Yeah, I'm a fluffer and I, I'm a daddy, but fair enough. Their argument is that, that because we see in hyperbolic geometry, which we... Anybody here, when was the last time anybody used the words hyperbolic geometry? Raise your hand. <laughs> Never. So, what should we call Bob a liar? Outright calling you a liar. You were literally talking about me in the last clip, so I can only assume by your stereotype that you've definitely bundled me in with, you're now claiming that I say this. You're a liar, Bob. There is no two ways about it. I've never, I don't think the words have crossed my lips, other than repeating them for you saying that we, by stereotyping fallacy, use this as our argument. Don't. Which we don't. Right. <laughs> But because our eyeballs are round and the back of our eyes are have hyperbolic geometry on the retina, we're somehow fooling ourselves into having an illusion or we're imagining a globe on a flat Earth. And as a result of that, every no, no, you're taking measurements of a flat Earth, like radial values, minimum elevation angle to Polaris, Bob. You aware of it? For your latitude system, it gives you the equator. That gives you your R value so that it can cross-engineer back into the flat-earth measurements that you'll take to derive it and use it. 
So it has to work in terms of a back engineering. That's why the circular flat plane radial value to the equatorial minimum on the equatorial plane is what was converted into a globe. But that's a flat earth measurement, my friend. Every different way that we measure the, the surface of the earth. It's all flat. In every single instance. Even if we measure it with the odometer, you know, the distance between two points. Sorry, an odometer. <laughs> okay. And apply the Haversine formula. Every, me every measurement comes out to the same wow. radius. Why would you have to apply a formula to a measurement to get curvature, Bob? Good question. Let me paraphrase that for you, John. Are you asking why, if you're measuring something spherically, i.e. a basketball, would you have to apply a conversion to spherical if you're measuring it as a sphere? There'd be no point making a spherical conversion if you're measuring it spherically. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yeah. Why are you applying the Haversine formula if you're me measuring it as a sphere already? Can I, can I answer? Because the Haversine is... Because he's not measuring it as a sphere. Earth's measured flat. But they're saying somehow because our eyes are different, even if we're not using our eyes that, that way, you know, therefore it's an illusion. You know, it's one of it's one of these arguments, you know, there are five that none of us made. <laughs> I call your curve calculations in an orthographic view perspective hijacking. No hyperbolic geometry described, perspective hijacking described. Things getting smaller into the distance, that's perspective. It's really simple. Maybe if you make it sound more complicated and claim an argument we haven't actually used with words we've never said, after describing me personally in stereotyping fallacies, you will, what, not get away with being called a liar? No, you are. You're just a liar, Bob. You know, you run into somebody like me. Well, weight changes by latitude is one. Fiber out. D does it? All those gold merchants are moving their gold, are they, so they can get more for it? <laughs> no, well, Bob. Latitude. No. <laughs> Go on, are you going to measure latitude, Bob, to get the... To assert that the downward vector on a flat plane changes, Bob. Your latitude description was a measurement of a flat plane, Bob. Part of your argument includes measurements of a flat Earth. Obviously, he was unaware of that when he said latitude. Optic laser ring gy yeah, and laser ring and gyros is another. Go ahead, whoever that was. I was just saying, and weight. Weight is a measurement with respect to a flat plane. And uh, this idea of the ring laser gyro, that, are they going to level that monkey before they use it? Or are they yes, gonna... they will, yes. Oh, yeah, they don't need a flat plane too, Bob. We're using a flat plane. Okay. There's a lot of things that you can do. The characteristics of shadows in, in sunrise and sunset. Sunrise and sunset with respect to a physical geometric sphere edge horizon blocking your view of said sun. No, we debunked that in 2020, Bob. Modus Tolens, Black Swan. You don't have a sphere yeah, edge horizon about the the sun anymore. Angle. Sorry, go ahead, John. He's taking the elevation angles from the sticks and shadows to claim that that proves it's a sphere when you're using that on a flat plane to get that. Oh, you'll need a flat earth for those sticks and shadows, Bob. Flat Earth required, depicted on screen now, right? Elevation angles, sticks and shadows, flat plane required, Bob. Can you stop using a flat Earth to make your examples, please, Bob? It's getting irritating and tiresome. You're constantly utilizing a flat Earth to make your claims of a globe. Um, the fact that a mechanical gyro compass works depends on the Earth rotating. Right, compass, as in pointing in directions on a plane. They're not ball directions, Bob. North isn't ball related, Bob. It works on flat maps, Bob. You'll need a flat plane for this, Bob. It does not work if the Earth does not rotate, and they do work, therefore... Sorry, what do you mean it does not work if the Earth rotates when you're talking about directions on a compass? 
has absolutely no bearing on your presupposed movement of the stars inferring that Earth's moving beneath our feet. You can debunk that as well. Coriolis deflection would be describing how Earth turns underneath a second reference frame. I'll refer you to Simon Dan. You and your reference frames have been ruined, Bob. Earth's not turning. Or the Earth is rotating. No, nah, your reference frames have been ruined, Bob. See Simon Dan. You know, they you know, you run into somebody like me. Well, weight changes by latitude is what I should have done a call to action ages ago. Please share the show. Hundred people watching. Woohoo! Please smash that share button. It's like two clicks to share the show. Really, really easy. Someone said that I should show people how to do that. I'm not going to do it right now. Literally right under the video, there's a button what? that says share. As soon as you click it, it brings up Facebook, Twitter, Bebo, MySpace. Click whichever one you use. And then it automatically brings up a link with a share link that shows the video. And you don't have to do anything. You just press share on your Facebook feed or whatever you're using. It's like two clicks. Share and then Facebook. And then it's done. One. What interesting enough, this claim. Go on. Oh, I was just saying this claim about weight changing with latitude. Weight is a linear downward vector in air in the vertical with respect to a horizontal plane, not a curve, Bob. And latitude is an angle measurement from the surface of Earth to a celestial body. It means the Earth's flat, Bob. It's Stop very it. annoying. Stop Just using stopped. flat Earth proofs, Bob. Laser ring and laser ring gyros is another, okay? There's a lot of things that you can do. The characteristics of shadows in, in sunrise and sunset. Um, the fact that a mechanical gyro compass works depends on the Earth rotating. Is there any more of these? Yeah, there's a few. You know, how many people can you go to and say, you know, what's the difference between Euclidean and hyperbolic geometry? How many people can actually answer that question and then explain that it has to do with this, you know, it's the surface that the triangle's on. It's not the triangle. Yeah. So flat That's earth. Wrong. Go ahead, John. You take the glory. You know, the hyperbolic geometry is done from the center of the sphere, and uh, Euclidean geometry is done from the surface of a plane. Um, they're both being done from a planar surface. We use straight lines to de define curves. He's an idiot, obviously, doesn't understand mathematics. Geometry. And, you know, when you answer it, it kind of flabbergasts them a little bit and they try and find something else to get you on. Yeah, they then... uh, I don't. I didn't think John was particularly flabbergasted. Did you feel flabbergasted, John? I felt insulted for all of mathematics and geometry that this guy's claiming he knows what he talk he's talking about. Change the, the subject, subject yeah. Then the nervous laughter starts and they start talking over you some more and interrupting you and then they throw you off the show. Or the, uh, the, or the condescending words. tone. Or, you know. With each other. The Coriolis, this is the great thing about science and scientific theories is they unify an enormous range of. But did you start off by talking about Coriolis? I mean, we've already referred him back to Simon Dan. I don't mind mentioning him twice in one show, Dan. Hey, you're popular today. You and your reference frames have been ruined, right? Let's see if that's useful again in a moment. But this isn't science. Coriolis effect is just a description of an effect we can observe. Most of the time, we're inducing the effect, although you can just about squeeze it into having a natural phenomena. But the descriptions of Coriolis effect aren't science, Planet Peterson. Of observations. So just... The science of observations. Fallacy of division taking part of the truth and applying it to the whole. No. Observation is the first step if you're observing a phenomena. That doesn't make observations science. If we just go with that the Earth is a sphere, that does explain why the night sky rotates clockwise and counterclockwise, depending on where you are. It Textbook affirming the constant uh, no, no, formal no. logical fallacy. Go ahead, John. He just claimed that the night sky rotated, which is real. If you're describing rotation, that's with respect to a flat plane. Uh, that's not their claim. Their claim is the Earth is rotating. The stars are fixed. So 
he can't make that claim without a flat plane. So he, he's just wrong. Let's explain why the night sky rotates clockwise and counterclockwise, depending on where you are. It yeah, he needs a flat plane for that as well. Explains the geometry of where the sun is, depending on your latitude and where... <laughs> latitude? You're going to need a flat Earth for that. It's a flat Earth measurement. Where the North Star is. And the fact you... this thing works. And how, and how a sextant works. On a flat plane only. And uh, so many other things. Now, what they do is, you know... The... How many more there are of these? We'll rattle our way through all of them as they've all been trimmed out. With each other. The Coriolis... Of... This is the great thing about science and scientific theories, is they unify an enormous so for range example, the moon of observations. Uh, we have a lot of documentation, a lot of warrant to believe the moon landings occurred. You believe it as much as you like. It took place via a journey through a second law of thermodynamics violation sky vacuum, though, didn't it? The burden of proof that you have is it's to prove that it took place in a second law of thermodynamics violation sky vacuum. It didn't. That would violate natural law. If the sky was a vacuum and rockets were capable of traversing the gas pressure, we're all breathing into an area 10 to the minus 17 to a vacuum, then so would all the gas we're breathing. We'd all be dead. That You have to show me that Neil Armstrong was in Hoboken, New Jersey on July 20th, 1969. You no, I can just debunk the area he's claimed to have gone to. In the same way, if someone says they've traversed a wardrobe to go to Narnia, all I need do is debunk the notion of travelling through wardrobes to a place that doesn't exist. Likewise, I can debunk the area that Neil is claimed to have travelled through, which is a sky vacuum by your estimation in a heliocentric world. Well, let me give you a rumpus quote. The second law of thermodynamics does not apply to the Earth. In your world where natural law doesn't apply to sky vacuums and ball Earths, meanwhile, natural law definitely applies to the world we inhabit. He was not where they said he was. You have to show me where he actually was. No, I don't. Do you remember yesterday when I gave the example of the guy who has a a, a tete-a-tete with his wife? And when she asks where he was, he says, I've been at the gym, 6 p.m. till midnight. And then the police come along and say, your husband has been in this industrial complex. He left his work at 4 p.m. and we've got him tracked by AMPR cameras to the industrial complex. He then left the industrial complex at 11 p.m. and came back home. We got him again, tracked on AMPR cameras. We've got his face on security with facial recognition. Here it is. Here's the pictures. And they turn around and say, well, you need to show me why he was in this place and when he was doing it, and why he wasn't in the gym. You go, no, no, I don't need to prove why he wasn't in the gym. Yeah, you do. Why wasn't he in the gym? No, no, I don't have to do that. I just have to show you that he wasn't where he says he was. It's like, no. In this instance, I don't need to do any of it. I just need to show that the sky is not a vacuum. Therefore, where he actually was when he was claimed to be in a place that isn't real is irrelevant. Does it matter where he actually was? He wasn't in a place that isn't real. He wasn't in a sky vacuum, in spite of where he said he was. Proving where he wasn't isn't my duty of care when it comes to telling people that the sky is not a vacuum. Could you imagine you this know. guy on a criminal if he was on a criminal jury, he would he would be like, OK, well, the defense has proven that the prosecution's uh, story is false, but they've not proven who did it. So this guy's guilty. That's that's Bob's reasoning. Yeah, it's sad, really sad. Hey, Adam. That one oh, more orbit flight that went pole to pole and circumnavigation. Orbits need a flat Earth, Bob. Talking about derivations of the angle differences off a flat plane. That's how your orbital mechanics have been derived, my friend. You're going to need a flat plane for those orbits. Navigated the world. You have to... Navigated? What, off a flat plane? Like all the new worlds we've discovered? With that sextant tool that you held up earlier? Those require Earth to be flat to get elevation angle measurements and derive areas of equal elevation. Big, massive circles. Flat in all directions, Bob. Definitely can't work on a sphere. Show me that's in a hangar in Palm Beach, Florida, and not over the South Pole. In order for your claim to have any validation. No, no, my claim, there isn't a claim. 
you mean when you reverse the burden of proof and suggest that when you're telling the world that Neil deGrasse Tyson, not Neil deGrasse Tyson, Neil Armstrong went to the moon because you can't show where he wasn't. Because <laughs> there's too much evidence to the contrary. No, there isn't any evidence that he went to a sky vacuum. In fact, it stands directly in violation of a natural law, Bob. There is no evidence. Now, I could spend forever looking at the evidence that they say is claimed to prove he went to some sound stage somewhere with a backdrop. But having worked in performing arts, I'm fairly familiar with backdrops, having paid a few myself. And uh, yeah, the moon landing footage has a backdrop in it. You know what I mean? It's not him on the moon. It's him on a stage. I'd know, wouldn't I, Bob? I've trained in it. That's a backdrop. Yeah? That's what backdrops look like. Like in The Wizard of Oz. Yeah? To the untrained eye, it looks like the field extends forever. But in reality, it's just a painted backdrop. Yeah? Like in the moon landing. Yeah, I'd know. I've been trained, Bob. Thanks for the uh, commendation in that regard. Yeah. You have to show me something that's overwhelmingly um, conclusive that... It like a second law of thermodynamics? Raise your hands if you think that a law of nature is pretty conclusive. Yes, Nathan. Yes, Nathan. Yeah, we all agree. He's also going to need a flat plane for that. Um, he's, going to, he's going to need a flat plane for his 14.7 um, uh, PSI at sea level for the claim of a vacuum of space. Yep. It was fake. Well, aren't you forgetting that they can just lean back on an argument from ignorance and just say, you can't go to space because the temperature in space is higher than the melting point of metal? That Sorry, who made this argument? Nobody's. Nobody? That. Nobody makes that argument. That's stupid. They don't even, they don't even make the same arguments that we point out. Maybe. Embarrassing. But is that not to anybody else who's ever watched any of the shows ever? A glaring straw man is just built up because it's nice and easy to knock down, right, Peterson? How pathetic! I mean, if you actually parroted off our argument, let's see how you get on. Maybe you will in a second. We'll see. That's an extremely stupid argument. The Van Allen belt radiation yep. is too dangerous. You can't have yep. an atmosphere next to a vacuum. All very yeah, stupid and disproved. The second law is one of my favorite ones. Is, is it really, Bob? The second law of thermodynamics is one of your favorite ones. What's your response to it? Which one is? The violation of the second law of thermodynamics oh. can't have a, a vacuum next to um, uh, an atmosphere. Yeah. Right. What's your response to it? Well, it just, a container. like I said, they don't even believe that. Um, sorry, sorry, your rebuttal is. We don't believe in a law of nature? Is that your rebuttal? Oh my god! I'm pretty sure that's not a rebuttal, my friend. Yeah? We don't need to believe in a description of that which occurs always. Entropy is real. It's not a belief. And your response to our argument that, yeah, your atmosphere can't exist next to a vacuum, further to that, your atmosphere is an oxymoron, air doesn't take the shape of a sphere, it fills its containment. But moronically, as you phrased it, you think that our argument is overcome by telling your audience we don't even believe in the second law of thermodynamics, a law of nature. Wonderful rebuttal there, Peterson. Wonderful, wonderful. I wonder what Bob's got. Because the same reason you supposedly can't have uh, a vacuum next to an atmosphere would be the same reason that you can't have an atmosphere that has partial or, or that has pressure gradients. When you open a can... So you're affirming what we've said. Yeah, saying that you can't have gas pressure next to a vacuum is the same as saying you can't have a gas pressure gradient next to a vacuum as well. That's right. You've affirmed our point there. And if you can have, if you can have the atmosphere at 0.01%, the pressure or density at sea level, which they don't even deny, then why can't it be basically zero uh -oh. at some point? Uh, because it's a second law of thermodynamics violation, you absolute clown. Zero sea level. What's that? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, George got it. Go ahead. It's fears they don't have that. It's going to need a flat earth for that sea level. Did no one else? John, he, he, you thought he'd caught something he hadn't. Go ahead. John. Well, no, he, he was right. The, the when he said uh, at sea level, that planet Peterson 
he, he needs a flat earth or sea level, not sea curve, sea level. And well, I, just no asked them at what, I just asked them at what altitude does the pressure gradient go to zero? It doesn't. That's the altitude. second law of thermodynamics <laughs> violation, Dumbo. Is there any more of these? So if you ever want to take a moment, plane. listen to uh, Nathan Oakley and have him talk about uh, Walter Bisland's uh, affirming the consequence, uh, consequence globe fallacy, earth, earth curve calculator, yep. uh, using yep. imaginary refraction in space that can't exist. Yeah. Okay. Not imaginary refraction, terrestrial refraction. Seven over six of a radius value measured off a flat plane. And, you know, and you, 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 he throws that out. It's a practice script that they have. Right, do you want to just compare and contrast what Bob says to what I say? Let's just hear it again. Using yeah. imaginary refraction in space that can't exist. Yeah. And, you know, and you, 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 he throws that out. It's a practice script. That what do you mean? Begging the question? Because it is. It assumes the outcome. It's got an R value in the calculation. Proof of nothing. That's because it's fallacious. It begs the question perspective hijacking because it takes that which we see reducing in angular size into the distance and describes it with a feet and inches value in an orthographic view that does not change in distance that's perspective hijacking earth curve calculator script you say no every single word in that description of the begging the question proof of nothing perspective hijacking earth curve calculator has come from 10 years of experience taking it apart it's not a script that they have also, and the, the curve calculator utilizes eye level. Oh, sorry. That curve calculator utilizes eye level and surface level as horizontal planes parallel to each other. Not curving, Bob. Walter Bislin's Earth Curve Calculator requires a horizontal plane of reference and eye level. Both are level. One is surface level. Proving Earth's flat in Walter Bislin's calculation. He needs Earth to be measured flat. That's why he's got a surface level that's flat in it. Bob. The, the purpose of that is to try and divert your attention to make you think about these other things. So what you do is you sit down and say, okay, we're, well, we're going to talk about Walter Bislin's then. You take the very first thing that they say, ignore the rest of it, and only respond to the first thing they say. So in my spiel, it would be begging the question. Okay, so when you respond to me saying your earth curve calculator begs the question, what are you going to do? No, it doesn't. It's in the title, Earth Curve Calculator. It's automatically assuming Earth Curve's real. So what are you going to do after you've just focused on that one absolute stone-cold fact that your Earth Curve Calculator assumes we've got Earth Curve? Yeah, maybe if you moved on to the second statement of proof of nothing based on begging the question, that's fallacious reasoning. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that statement stands on its own as well. Maybe if you got to the perspective hijacking aspect of your Earth Curve calculator in orthographic view, where feet and inches value don't change with any distance. Because a 10-foot wall in Earth Curve maths is 10 foot and visible a million miles. Oh, no, unless Earth Curve gets in the way. It's not the stuff gets smaller. That doesn't exist in Earth Curve maths. You've hijacked the effect and called it Earth Curve, Bob. That's why I call it the perspective hijacking Earth Curve calculator, because it is. It's not just spiel. It's not just a, sh a script, as you call it. And that's one way to keep them on task. And really? You think asking me about begging the question, proof of nothing, perspective, hijacking earth curve calculators by way of focusing on the first thing I say will keep me on task? <laughs> yeah, you did really well when you came here, Bob. I'm pretty sure you had your ass handed to you by me. Prevent them from derailing the conversation. Oh. Maybe I'll have to trim out a few of the times Bob was reduced to a stuttering, stammering moron on this show by me, just to remind him exactly what happened when he came here. If you ever want... Uh, he came here, by the way, Peterson. Yeah? Bob, unlike you, has a set. You are an abject coward. You wouldn't come here. Yeah? Maybe you'll do like that guy who I'm told about in my pre-show is making demands of my time like I should come to him. When I've got an open door for any of you cowards to stroll straight through and prove Earth is flat, just like Bob did. I want to take a moment. Listen to uh, Nathan. Let's see if there's another one. 
Yeah, I've I, I've heard I've heard a lot of flat earthers say something to the effect of uh, uh, pilots are trained on flat maps and and maps are flat. Why do you think that is? I was like, because Earth is flat, and if they weren't, you wouldn't get elevation angle measurements to work with areas of equal elevation. So they've got to be flat maps because otherwise they won't work with navigation systems. Earth is flat. It wouldn't have reference. Go ahead. It wouldn't have cartography either with yeah. the with the cardinal systems. Yeah. Yeah. Your whole grid is derived from a measurement of Polaris and the sun off a flat plane. That's what gives you your grid on all your maps. It is flat, Peterson. You're just ignorant. Like, because paper is flat. No, no, no. Because the measurements of Polaris to give you latitude, which you referenced earlier, but were too dumb to know how the measurement came from when you referenced it. Because if you were smart enough to know where that latitude you referred to came from, you'd know it was a measurement of Polaris off a flat plane with an elevation angle measurement. Like the tool that your numpty partner in crime here held up? A sextant? Yeah, it measures two straight lines, numpty. That's what gave you that grid. The latitude that you referenced. Measured off a flat earth for the maps. So is the earth? Like, that's your argument? No. No, the minimum elevation angle measurement to Polaris derived your radial value and the maps and the grid. But you think our argument is because paper is flat. Now, that would be you smiling about your own little special straw man that you've created there, Peterson. And then they tend to say stuff that's just a flat out lie. What, like you telling us that we've made an argument that a map being flat because paper is flat is why Earth is flat? No, Peterson, that's known as projection. Straight after a total straw man lie that none of us have ever made, you say, these people just lie. Yeah, like you just did. Yeah? Find me a clip of anybody saying, because paper is flat, therefore maps are flat, therefore Earth is flat. As opposed to, maps are flat so they can work with elevation angle measurements with respect to the horizontal baseline. Or, maps are flat because they have to work with areas of equal elevation, circles two-dimensional in nature that are with respect to a plane that has no elevation changes on it. Those sorts of arguments. Oh, that 2 p brain Peterson who can't undo any of those arguments. He hears, paper is flat. And then goes on about our people who he's responding to lie. Yeah, you do. And without knowing, and it, but it's going to be, it's extremely esoteric knowledge. Well, many stutters after claiming people are liars there, Peterson. You need to stutter and stammer around the fact that you've just projected out your own lies onto us. Yeah, stuttering, stammering clown. No, you are the liar, projector. Nobody's claiming that because paper's pat that flat that the earth is flat. That's utterly absurd and never an argument that has crossed anybody's lips ever. It's garbage. It's like, did you know that according to the 1986 NASA documents to show that the, uh, whatever, the training module they yeah, had for the yeah. digital program is... So you know the year, what the ones we presented... I thought you didn't like the sound of my voice, Peterson, but yet you're getting all of this information from us about the NASA documents that describe Earth as a flat, non-rotating plane. That document. It assumes a flat, non-rotating disk or whatever. Plane. Yeah, that's because that's what NASA said in that document. Or whatever. No, it's just what NASA specifically say when talking about aviation. Because you wouldn't want to have your pilots heading towards a massive opening avoid opening up at eight inches per mile squared if there wasn't one because they'd die so given that in your world there's a massive void opening up ahead of everybody at eight inches per mile squared and nasa when training their pilots make it explicitly clear that there isn't one it's a flat non-rotating plane is that whatever whatever right it's just nasa and what they say about our earth being flat is going to be how they train their pilots yeah well you see yeah i've I've heard I've heard a lot of flat earthers say something to the happening around that. Well, when we can start getting resources out of space, asteroids, uh, hydrogen, soil, oil. I mean, all of these things will come from the sky eventually. I can just see myself looking up at these clouds now thinking, I wonder how many oil refineries will eventually be up in that sky. Three water on, on the moon. You know, it may get a little bit more interesting but right is that someone from my panel yeah i was gonna say it's the same bait that the ethereans did the free energy they limited resources in a place that doesn't exist 
you know, yep. up there in the sky vacuum. We can get all these things. It has to be real. There's so many resources in the sky vacuum or on that light in the sky we call the moon or in the hollow earth that Admiral Bird was talking about or in the ether. I mean, who knows? <laughs> garbage. You're a fantasist, Bob. It's pathetic. Yeah, those actors, those trained actors, as much as you mock me, they got one over on you with backdrops and now you think there's resources on lights in the sky, my friend. You were duped by actors. That's what Neil is. He's more like me than the fantasy that you have of him being a god flying around in the sky. He isn't. Wasn't. He's a liar. Was. Right now, it's kind of viewed as high seas. Uh, anybody's in trouble, you do everything you can to rescue them. You know, well, you'll be navigating with a flat earth then. You no. Know, you wave at each other as you go by. Yeah. You know, that sort of stuff. You know, we try and advise them of when we're doing things. They try and advise us when they're doing things. You know, it works for the most part. Yeah. You know, when we watched Apollo 11, there were Russian spy ships off of Florida. And basically, they went out there and, you know, they were really worried that the Russians would interfere with the communications. And basically, they went out there and said, look, here are the frequencies we're using. Don't screw with us. You know? Um, and and they didn't. Yeah. So... So, just, now nah, we're not going to mess with you in Narnia. What's that? Is the frequencies you're using to radio back through the wardrobe? Don't mess with us. <laughs> they were travelling to a sky vacuum, Bob. It's nice that you can reminisce about how when you were a kid you were bullshitted to about this garbage of sky vacuums and trips to the moon, and you bought it wholeheartedly. But it was actors, Bob. Take it from a trained actor. They frauded you. They faked it. They put up backdrops on a stage and filmed it. That's what they did, Bob. Yeah? With trapeze. Something else I trained on. Yeah? High wire? Floating around on wires? That's what they're doing, Bob. Yeah? Take it from me. Well, we're currently uh, serving uh, basically a proxy, or we're engaged in a proxy war with Russia. No, 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 no. The Russians and the Americans have got trained actors in harnesses on sets together. Yeah? Take it from a trained actor. They're on harnesses. Yeah? That's what they're doing. Behind green screens now, it used to be painted backdrops, like in the theatre days, for me too. Yeah? There wasn't any of this newfangled green screen technology. They had to literally paint the backdrop on canvas. And drop it out like you can see in the moon landing footage, Bob. Just have a little look. You can see the little line where the backdrop ends. And it kind of looks like the moon's carrying on into the distance. But really, it's just a backdrop on a stage. You've been duped by people like me, Bob. Actors. Trained actors. You knew how to get the better of people who didn't know any better. You. You weren't trained on how to spot a backdrop because you've never made one. Have you, Bob? I have. So I saw it immediately in the moon landing footage. I mean, that's a backdrop right there. This is all fake. I No, I'm a trained actor. I've painted backdrops. <laughs> While collaborating in space with... No, no, on stage, on high wires when they claim to be on the ISS. They're on high wires, trapeze, in a little harness with thin wires. Yeah? Acting like they're in space. You know, like Superman? Have you never seen Superman? Yeah? It's pretend. Superman isn't really flying around a globe Earth. It's pretend. Yeah, these guys, the Russians, the Americans, it's all a charade, my friend. It's all a big joke. Yeah? But the joke's on you, not me. With Russia every single day. Yep. I mean, that's, that's pretty fascinating how uh, two groups that are uh, spending billions of dollars to... Do hoax the world. I have a question. I, I don't know if you know the answer to this. I suspect you probably do, though. Um, I know that the way we measure our distance uh, to the sun is to, well, take a derivation of a flat Earth radial value and then take Kepler's ideas of orbital motion and Huygens' ideas that the Venus trajectory has a scaling use because Venus has the same radial value as Earth had when deriving that measurement with the equatorial minimum.
by way of an elevation angle measurement to Polaris on a flat Earth. That is the history of your distance to the sun. Well, the first way it was done was to, you know, observe a transit of Venus from two different places. On No, that's what Hugens did much, much later. You are ignorant of your own bloody rhetoric. On Earth. But I, I couldn't possibly explain to somebody how you actually do that. Do you know? Because uh, you don't understand the story or the rhetoric or Kepler. Because all of those came before Hugens. But you don't know how Hugens, what, observed the light tra traversing the sky, occulting the sun. That's all it is. It's the transit of Venus. It's a little tiny dot moving past the sun. How complicated can it be? You don't know how he did it. It doesn't matter how he looked at it and observed it. What matters is he assumed that light had the same radial value as Earth when measured as a flat plane. That's the actual crux of the important bit. The assumption that Venus has the same radial value. So we can apply that radial value for Venus, Earth's twin, to Kepler's orbital motions, which don't have any scale. You don't have anything to give you scale until you make an assumption, which is precisely what Hugens did. You just don't know your own rhetoric. You're way over your head with this stuff, Planet Peterson. You're so ignorant of your own stupid rhetoric, it's untrue. You've got to ask Bob about it. Pathetic. Oh, how that measurement is, is done? Well, it was done. I have a question. I, I don't know. It's done. Initially, it was done in terms of uh, the distance to the moon by Aris, uh, Aristarchus of Samos. And I've got two videos what? on my channel about all of the geometry that he developed 2,300 years ago that actually works. The only reason he came up with the wrong answer is his measurements weren't accurate enough. Hmm. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Am I hearing this right? The reason he came up with the wrong answers? <laughs> what the hell? Let's see if Peterson catches that. So we can determine the distance to the uh, sun that way. Uh, the second... What, the wrong way? Is this processing? Are the cogs turning in Peterson's head or what? way we determine the distance to the sun is that uh, oh. they assume that Venus... He's not, go ahead, go ahead. He's not detailing what the measurements are. Have you noticed that? They won't even talk about the measurements anymore. They'll allude to them, but they won't try to describe them as angle measurements anymore, will they? No, but he's not, he's not even describing what Hugens did, though. He's describing something completely ancillary to that. So at the end of this, the question is, basically, how did Hugens take his measurement? Would you not say that that's a succinct rendition of what Peterson actually asked? Is he getting an answer to that question? Like, at all? Not, is he no. diverting around the question because it's awkward because it's angles off a flat plane? Yeah, I get your point. But he's not even answering that, is he? No. No, no it, it's like... We make a gun shy about measurement now. <laughs> was the same size as the Earth and used the angular size because they knew the relative distance between Venus. Well, they knew that Venus, I think, is what, 0. 0.72 or 0. 0.78 uh, astronomical units from the sun, and we're one astronomical unit from the sun. So based on Kepler's astronomical units after you derive the distance by getting an AU, that's the process, isn't it, Bob? It sounds like Bob doesn't actually know this process. He sounds like he's bullshitting around it. So you can use that distance between Earth and Venus. Or what distance? You've got to infer the distance through Kepler and his scale. And the way you can get an actual value is by inserting a presuppositional value for the scale that you're going to use with Venus to kind of get an idea uh, based on angular size about how far the sun is. Angular size won't give you distance. You need to either know the distance or know its actual size. That's what you need. And you don't have either, Bob, do you? And it was actually pretty accurate. No, no, no. It won't give you anything. There's no accuracy by way of just looking at the size of something by way of its angle. That doesn't give you anything. You either need to know its actual size to begin with or its actual distance. And you don't have either. Hugens assumed Venus had the same size as Earth. Do you not know this, Bob? Why is it I, the flat earther, have got to actually fill you in on your rhetoric? He made a, and I quote, ingenious assumption. That's how it's documented, Bob. Hugens' ingenious assumption that Venus had the same spherical R value as Earth. 
Why haven't you told Peterson that? Are you withholding this or are you just ignorant, Bob? But that was based on a new... I just doesn't tell him. Running out of ideas. What's your favorite argument to hear just because of how dumb it is and how easy it is to dismantle and watch them panic? For me, it's water always finds its level. That's my favorite. It Excuse me, I'm just having a drink. Come again? Sorry, this principle that's used in building things, you find that hilarious? Oh, I'll, I'll let the entire master race of builders know. I'll contact the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors immediately. Are you having me on? Hey, let's, let's go and call up all the celestial navigators and say, mean sea level is garbage. Don't use it anymore. Um... Yeah, just throw that out. Bubble sextants, bubble sextants, useless. Level. Forget your bubble sextants. Just Peterson objects that. He finds it laughable. What's that? You use a spirit level at work? <laughs> spirit level. <laughs> Water for you being used to, to find things level? No. Have you not heard Planet Peterson? He thinks that's laughable. It looks flat to me. Oh, interesting. I mean, it... Kind of does. Yes, yeah, it looks flat to me. Therefore, it is flat. Uh, it's being used to measure the world. That's what water is used for. Water is used to find level. That's its primary use in building things. But what you think that you can dilute that back down to, it looks level. Yeah, it does if you've got a spirit level. It's using the principles and properties of water to find a level. Or a bubble sextant. So what, but this is just laughable because according to you, that principle used in building is summarised as if it looks level, it is, therefore it isn't because I'm just saying they say it looks level, but it isn't really. This is crap. These two are idiots. Yeah, I don't know what, I don't know what fallacy that is. That's kind it's of... It's not a fallacy. It's a principle used in building things. An argument from ignorance, I guess. Uh, no, it's an argument about how we build things. <laughs> Say again. Did he just claim something that was axiomatic was an argument from ignorance? That's the word I couldn't find. The axiomatic principle of water being level, finding and maintaining said level, as used in building, that axiomatic principle he has described as an argument from ignorance. That is correct. This is the level. This is what we have to deal with. Dunning-Kruger idiots. Not exactly. I, I don't play, you know. Running out of ideas. What's your favorite? Uh, Oakley does in his unbearable uh, tone of voice is he says, uh, you're, you're affirming the consequent and stuff like that. Um, so what? And it, yeah, well, it's like, OK, but that doesn't mean that it's not true. It means that it... That's called the fallacy fallacy. A fallacy fallacy. Uh, no, it isn't. <laughs> a fallacy fallacy is where a fallacy has been employed to make a claim that can actually be demonstrated after the use of fallacy to be true. For example, if I was to say that Bob's claim that his car is red because if we have... a uh, blue clouds in the morning or a nice clear blue sky in the morning then his car is red and we do have a nice clear blue sky in the morning therefore his car is red and i say no that's an affirming the consequent fallacy and then because i claim there is no way you can ever demonstrate the color of your car to me therefore your argument is void and it is ultimately unprovable that you have a red car he can then claim the fallacy fallacy because he can easily demonstrate by rolling his red car in front of me that that is still the case. And therefore, claiming that the argument is void solely based on fallacy because a fallacy has been employed when the argument can be demonstrated to be true by another means. If you void the argument anyway, in other words, I discount the fact that he's got a red car anyway, simply because he has used a fallacy to claim it, then that's the fallacy fallacy. And affirming the consequent fallacy is if P then Q, Q therefore P. And the fallacy comes in the form of Q not necessarily following the P statement that you are begged the question with. For example, <clears throat> if Earth is a sphere, 
then we will observe antipodal star rotation in the North and South Hemisphere. We do observe antipodal star rotation in the North and South Hemisphere, therefore Earth is a sphere. That is an affirming the consequent formal logical fallacy. If P then Q, Q therefore P. The Q statement may be a statement that you can offer up some semblance of evidence for. In this, in this instance, you look up at the stars and they all move in the same direction for everyone, always, just to get that clear. But you can say that somebody observing the stars moving in the same direction, always, without exception, is a proof that when I travel south, I am now antipodal when I turn around. Now that is an affirming the consequent formal logical fallacy, exampled by way of a globe description of a proof of star rotation, meaning that Earth is a turning body, with the fallacy and an unpacking of the form and function of the fallacy with the example. That's what I do when I demonstrate a fallacy. It is not the fallacy fallacy when I say that you have affirmed the consequent to say that we are antipodal when suggesting that Earth is a sphere. It is, in fact, an affirming the consequent fallacy, as opposed to these numpties claiming that they have then gone on to prove that we have antipodal positioning, therefore proven to be non-fallacious just in reasoning, but ultimately a true statement that they've proven after the fact when using fallacious reasoning to claim it in the first instance. Ergo, fallacy, fallacy. This isn't that, you complete pair of clowns. Fallacy, yeah. Yeah, yeah like... Uh, because... You know, I call it the even a blind squirrel gets a nut sometimes fallacy. That's funny. Because occasionally you can... Because occasionally Bob Di just makes up fallacies that don't exist and gives them names. Even though you've described what I actually use when I pull apart your rhetoric, for example, antipodal star rotation, they all move in the same direction, by the way. Yeah, you stupid idiots. Yeah, when they turn the other way, it's because you've turned around, you stupid boy what you are a stupid boy talking to a stupid old man because you're both idiots you can use a fallacious argument and still come to the correct conclusion no you can't if you use a fallacious argument the argument is void now if you can demonstrate by another means that your claim is true then fine i'll accept it but the argument by way of fallacious logic is void These people are clowns. Bob wouldn't know logic if it slapped him in the face. But you can actually, with the Eratosthenes experiment, you can make the... Not an experiment. It requires a flat plane. Prediction of the shadow on the sticks. Yeah, that's a flat plane proof. You need two straight lines meeting at a vertex to call it an angle. One is along the ground. That's a flat earth proof, Bob. Using both the flat earth and the spherical earth. Nope, you can't get an elevation angle measurement from a curved baseline. A curved line meeting a straight line is not an angle. It's not a vertex. Uh, actually, I'll take that back. Sure, you can actually call a curved line meeting a straight one a vertex, but you definitely can't call it an angle. So it won't work on both flat Earth and globe. It can only work on a flat Earth. Yeah, yeah. You just have to just like do multiple measurements. Yeah, I calculated. You know the. You know when I did the horizontal across my lake. I said, on a flat earth, this is what I'm going to see. On a spherical uh -oh. earth, this is what I'm going to see. What, an angle from a curve with relation to the ground? You won't get that, Bob. You can't take an elevation angle measurement with respect to a horizontal baseline, which is precisely what you're doing with that tool you held up earlier. You cannot do that with respect to a curved surface. It cannot be done. It has to be flat to measure an angle. Go ahead. Whoever that yeah, was. Hold on. His mate was uh, laughing about uh, uh, flat earth is referring the water to be flat. Uh, Bob is using uh, the water to be flat. No one is laughing. No, they can contradict themselves repeatedly. I am realizing they're doing it. This is my margin of error. I have to be better than that or I'm going to consider it unproven either way. Guess which one it matched? The spherical earth. Oh. By a what, your angle matched up with a curve, did it? Now, fundamentally un unprovable, Bob, you can't get your angle, that's two straight lines, to match a curved surface. Um, like we know the special sphere models. 
yeah, celestial sphere model would be with respect to an equatorial plane. That's a flat Earth inside a globe. Still a flat Earth that the measurements are coming from, though. Flat lines along the baseline. And right on cue, here's the uh, flat Earth measurement that he referred to with the form of Aristophanes. This is off a flat plane. These lines, these angles, they're all with respect to a horizontal plane of reference. Flat Earth required, Bob. That was so far ahead of time. Like, there was an annular solar eclipse back in October. We knew that was going to happen years ago, right? Mm -hmm. uh, my challenge to them would be predict the next time Mars goes in retrograde or predict any upcoming eclipse and show your work. All of this has been plotted and planned off that. a flat plane for centuries. Your globe reification for retrograde? See, he doesn't understand that he's got a malformed question when he's asking people to describe how the motion of the stars throughout the ages has been tracked and can be predicted for literally thousands of years into the future if you wanted to. Yeah? We've got the almanac! We know where they'll be. We navigate with them, you numpty. But you're asking us to show our work. I go and buy a copy of the almanac, you stupid boy. Yeah, and what you'll realise is those positions are known well and truly. Yeah, they, their motions and predictions. The only problem I have with your question is you said retrograde. Retrograde comes only within the definitions that you have hijacked with measurements of a flat plane for things like the transit of Venus with respect to an... Flat Earth measured equatorial value at its minimum for Polaris, measured off a flat plane, to give you the outside edge of your ball Earth that took that flat Earth measurement to make it. All of these inferences use the same exact flat plane when you're talking about the stars. But retrograde, that's purely heliocentric. But you're asking us to work within the confines of your heliocentric explanation for retrograde motion. And that also requires a flat plane. All of the angle differences that were measured and tracked to give us the predictions into the future of where the stars will be so we can navigate with them were done on a flat plane. Sod all to do with retrograde. Yeah. I actually have a video I can recommend for him. It's a uh, NASA from 1986 going over the basics of orbital mechanics. They'll explain everything to you off a flat plane just so you can understand it. Got it up on screen now. Here's the plane of the ecliptic, and here's an angle measurement to a star. As you will notice, the globe Earth is no longer the surface that you are standing on. In fact, it's more akin to a protractor that you'd be holding at the centre of Earth in hell if you were to believe that Earth was a sphere. But what you're actually measuring is a massive flat plane, flat in all directions with a line running along the flat ground now, don't get me wrong, they've had to infer that somehow there's a sphere Earth involved in this process. It isn't. It's merely representation of the protractor from a flat plane out to the celestial sphere. That's what the world actually functions like. And that's what gives you all of the lot land uh, longitude and latitude grid. They are measurements of Polaris with respect to a plane. Then transpose down onto the sphere of surface like you're standing on it. But you're not. It won't work that way. You will measure the angles with respect to a plane. And if you're going to describe it in terms of navigation, you'll be describing those angles inside a globe. Because then the globe is just the protractor, which is the way this entire magic trick has worked from the off. Because the only way you can't do that with a flat model, which is like a weird neo Ticonian model, because there's no there's no mathematical um, regularity with it. It's, it's totally chaotic. The epicycles don't work for anything. So now you're calling them epicycles. Was it Ptolemy that was originally describing them as epicycles? Make up your mind. The only reason we've got retrograde motion is because you couldn't explain epicycles. But again, the angle differences of these stars are measured with respect to a flat plane. This is problems. Epicycles and retrograde motion are problems with a heliocentric or geocentric world description of the stars' movements. It doesn't alter how they're going to move. Furthermore, your elliptical orbital motions have been 
instigated by the church to give you better predictive capabilities of things like retrograde motion. Again, all measurements taken from a flat plane. Thing because they because <laughs> because of the fact that these things are going around the sun. Well, they don't understand the basic. They're not. Your orbital motions derived from measurements of a flat plane. To infer that you've got an R value to put the stars in motion around a heliocentric based sun and an Earth moving around that requires you first measure a radial value off a flat plane by deriving it from an angle measurement to Polaris. You first need to measure the stars with respect to a flat Earth to give you your inference of radial value, to give you your inference of sphericity, to give you your inference of orbital motion. Orbital motion has its genesis in flat Earth measurements. It's a meaning of words. They seem to think that geocentric... They seem to think that geocentric just means observing the solar system from Earth. And I said, no, geocentric means everything. Next. Um, he doesn't, he thinks pre, like, I don't know we what know. geocentric means. Well, <laughs> means Earth-centric. I was so far ahead of time. Like, there was an annular solar eclipse back in October. We knew that was going to happen years ago, right? Mm -hmm. uh, my challenge to them would be predict the next... Oh, that's it. That's the last clip. All right, any comments? Thank you very much for trimming all those out, by the way. Yeah. Mighty Mush. My pleasure, bro. I would like to point out... Great job. Great job, Rudy. I would like to point out... Just let, just let Mush take his credit. Go ahead, Mush. No, nah, no credit, bro. Credit to you, man. Great job reviewing, and uh, yeah, the whole the whole time about just straw mans. That's all they did. It's super easy when you've trimmed out all the clips for me. I just click on the next one and then react. It's really easy. Thank you. Nice. Cheers, brother. Go ahead, John. Yeah, the predictive model that that predictive model that he was claiming um, is a flat Earth predictive model. It's not a globe predictive model. So, yeah, I would like to see them do their predictions from a globe. Let's see that for once. Chris Badio right there. Come again. Theo is coming in very crisp today. Theo? It's my bad for joining in a conversation that was happening during my outro. I don't know what you're talking about. Sorry. And it looks like I'm never going to find out either. I think Mr. Palmer said everything was coming out super clear today for some reason. I think he was talking about the sound. Yeah, we've sorted but, uh... out Maybe last time he joined, it was because we had a Discord issue. We figured it out. I spent several days trying to figure out what the issue was and eventually found it. Now it should be super clear everywhere. Nice. And uh, Elvis is also here. Shout out to Elvis for sharing the Neil deGrasse Tyson did this morning. Elvis? I thought he was dead. <laughs> oh, he's in the chat. Elvis Kavorvik. No, no, I'm, al I'm alive. I'm alive, baby. <laughs> is it Elvis Kavorvik? Yep. Do I say your name correctly? Not really, but uh, good enough for English words. Yeah, yeah, good enough. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> good. Please do it. Thank you for your support. Absolutely. Thank you guys for all you do and uh, great review. So... Before the show started, AI was telling us that there's been rumblings and mobilization as a result of literally just us saying, ah, should we go out to a few different servers? Has anybody else heard anything similar or seen anything similar to what AI was describing? Because it's a new one on me, and I can only assume if he's suggesting that or saying that, 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 that then, you know, I don't... AI is not the type of person to just make crap up. You know what I mean? Anybody else come across that? We had more ballers recently coming in, so I would say it it, it has an impact.
Cool. We're going to Oath Awakenings tomorrow, just so you know. Or well, the land of misfit toys, as John calls it. Nice. Well, it's been a very, very slow show today. I've got to be honest. I'm very disappointed in Discord. Well, I was going to ask um, CTVI uh, is a ball that has been here from the, from the beginning of the show. If he has any questions, anything at all that uh, he wants to interject or reject. Do we have a well, resident just, uh, baller in? Who is in? There's a baller? CTVI. ETVI, you there? I don't. Oh, okay. Clearly not. And we did have conversation in Discord in the morning show. It was all Discord, wasn't it? Just that when uh, you started the live yeah. show, you started the clip things, and people were just listening to the clips. You're a bit quiet, righteous. I am. Well, did you get what I said, though? I heard what you said. Go ahead, AI. Uh, I was just going to say that so some of the members that are present here don't really frequent the other venues enough to notice the changes, I think. Like, I, I can see the names here. They, they're very rarely in those other forums. Fair enough. I'm just more surprised so what exact that, that it would be necessary. AI? That's that's the thing that surprises me, AI. You know, why would it be necessary to to gen up your your opponent's skills or you know I don't know I, it doesn't really make much sense to me that, that, that there needs to be any reaction to what we're doing. Well, I mean, it, you know, it's kind of like look, you're you're critiquing a video or or some things, right, that you don't agree with, right? That's what you were doing for the past hour, right? Yeah. And so, likewise, other other venues are doing the same, but they're not necessarily doing it against the mainstream. They're doing it against "quote unquote" flat earthers or other type of people in the community, right? Oh, I see. So when you went stepped out, right? You were essentially whether you're whether you're you're right in your opinion is, is irrelevant to this point. Is that you said? I have an opinion or or claim or conclusion that I'm going to go out with 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 a uh, you know confidence. That being said, other people who have other claims that aren't necessarily agree with you, maybe even be against your positions, they now have oh wait a minute Nathan's mobilizing. Now I have to count, count you know do the same. I have to up my game. Gotcha. It's like watching one of the kids that typically goes out into the playground and plays British Bulldog or Tig or whatever you call it over there. You yeah. one day see him strapping up his football boots and studs and you go, oh, he's taking the initiative. Maybe I should go and get my football boots too. Okay. Oh, so like uh, you did the the AMA, right? And uh, you know, there there's a guy there. That, you know, we know him as XO here. You know, he's like, oh, I want to I want to present to you my new information, right? Yeah, which is not bad, but you know, you know, these guys guys like him have a history, and it's no secret that he calls flat earthers liars, right? And there's other people in the community that we know of that call flat earthers liars, right? We've, we've seen it a million times. It's like, okay, flat earth isn't an accurate term. My term's better, and these are my reasons why I'm better than you, why I'm more accurate than you, why your argument isn't as good as mine, 
right? And it's okay to critique each other, sure. But when you have this, like, attitude where I'm correct and everyone else is lying, you know, it really sours the whole pot, you know what I mean? Yeah, Brian. Are you talking about XO? Isn't he a flat earther? Yeah. Well, well he was he, a few years ago. I don't understand. He would never. Now he would say, I'm not a flat earther, right? It's mm-hmm. a common thing now. You know, you hear it all the time. People are other earthers, whatever they pick. True earthers, biblical earthers, upward rising earthers, realm earthers, water worlders. You've heard a million titles probably by now. Well, let's be more fair. Maybe like 30. <laughs> yeah. And to me, it says if, if, if they had a silver bullet that they could say, this is proof. They wouldn't need to rename themselves. They wouldn't care about the, um, I was gonna say tarnish that comes with the words flat Earth. You wouldn't care. You're like, yeah, okay. I'd, I'd have to disclaim that. I very rarely disclaim to anybody when I'm out and about in general life that I'm a flat Earther. It doesn't come up. I've had the conversations. Well, one of the risks. Go on. Go ahead. So one, yeah, one of the resurgences that we had recently. You know, there was a marked time when it started really upticking coming into the 24-7 uh, server and channel of politics is that these are these guys, they are, they're the not flats, right? They're, their primary contention is to arrive and say the Earth's not flat. Now you say, oh, what is a globe? And they'd be like, no, it's just not flat, right? Well, why isn't it flat? Oh, because there's elevation changes. It's like, oh, you thought I meant there's no elevation changes? Wow, bro. <laughs> but that's their shtick. It's not flat. I can go out and measure off a horizontal plane, difference in elevations and variances, right? Therefore, it's not flat. Therefore, and this is where it really pisses me off, because technically they're correct in that definition, but there are other applications of the term flat. But what pisses me off is they then go on to say, that people who call them flat selves flat earthers are lying, are immoral, are untoward. You know, and of course, you're a figurehead for that because you have coined the phrase, it's measured flat, and they have a beef with that, and they like to go around to everyone but you and tell everyone else how crappy they are because you say these things. And it's like, dude, why don't you just ask him what he means by that? Um, and, and the definition of measurement, is it a measurement if you don't include the reference as part of the measurement? If you don't include it, is it a measurement then? So no, if you're going to describe the elevation changes and you don't reference the horizontal baseline that the elevation changes are with respect to, then can would you say that isn't a measurement if you don't reference them to a reference point, in this case a horizontal plane? then no, because you're not referencing it to something to say how those elevation changes would work. So no, you couldn't call it a measurement of elevation changes unless you reference a flat earth in the first instance to tell the person how high or low they are with respect to that horizontal plane that would be a flat earth that you're using to describe those elevation changes with. Ergo, no, it wouldn't be a measurement. But decrying the flat earth that they use to reference their elevation changes is decrying their own measurement. John, in essence, yes. So when they say that, that you don't measure the earth flat, that's just them being stupid. Yes. Well, it's, it's roughly a technicality, really. You know, in, in a strictest definition of a, of a singular application of the term with the definition and connotation, Right, then they, they are technically correct. Right. And and so they harp on this, look, we've got this technical correct point, but it's really not correct in the way in which we employ language, you know. Is that a Homer Simpson line? Isn't that the best kind of correct? <laughs> a technicality. <Yeah. laughs> well well, uh, it, well technically you have to include the reference in your measurement or technically it's not a measurement so technically they're wrong oh i mean technically you're wrong so you're both technically wrong it all depends on how you define your terms yes. and your application yeah and that's the problem so 
So you, right, might say they're technically wrong, and that's fine. Now, would you assume they're a liar? No. The, 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 the semantics well, game that we're playing when we're disagreeing that. about flatness and reference to flatness to describe how non-flat <clears throat> it is, is a semantical game. It doesn't follow that the person who's arguing one aspect of semantics, even if they're ignorant about their opponent's side, is a liar. Absolutely not. But well, we are talking about semantics. Oh, so what's the I've got a little background noise from AI. Can you pop, hold on one second. It's a bit of audio chaos. Can you pop yourself on mute, AI? Unless, unless you want to go sure. next. Unless you no, want to go. I've got, got to do some hammering, so go ahead. <laughs> Jolly good. Hey, John. The definition of measurement requires a reference. The reference is flat. It's the flat earth. You will be referencing it too. So you're talking about topology changes with respect to how flat the overall earth is. That's what you're talking about with elevation. So to say the earth's not flat, we just measure it from what? Well, it's a closed ended so statement. People, I think AI is arguing well, it's only when you invoke the measurement. So earth isn't flat. As a, as a very open-ended statement they could have on a technicality. It's just very vague and loose. And as soon as you quantify it in any term whatsoever, like they do, we're, because we've got elevation changes, as soon as they say that, they've compromised their own argument because to describe the measurement of elevation changes requires an invocation of the horizontal plane that the differences in elevation are with respect to. Therefore, their statement is then false. But as just as, a, as an open-ended statement, Earth isn't flat. And then you ask them to well, qualify. Hold on. So the, the claim the claim evolves. Well, we don't reference the Earth when we measure from a horizontal plane. <laughs> right. That's, that's single point that's data. Claim. Yeah, yeah. Right. They say they measure from a single point. What's that single point? Well, it's on a vertical datum. Yeah, but that single point is referenced to the entire horizontal plane that the elevation changes are with respect to. But because Bev has managed to brainwash his whole audience in, into believing that's a single point on a horizontal datum that has nothing yeah, to do so with... Uh, to... Sorry, a vertical datum that has nothing to do with the horizontal. They've all bought it. I don't know how so, he's managed to get them to swallow it, but he has. Yeah, so last time, last time I was on the show, we, we parsed out what a horizontal is and where it comes from in the first instance. And uh, horizontal is parallel to the plane of the horizon, right? We agree. Yes, it's obvious, right? That's what it is. So then, then you know, it begs the question: What is a horizon? Because if horizontal is parallel to the horizon, then what is the horizon? The optical dissolution point for a horizontal plane that we're dwelling atop. The reason we can establish things like parallel planes is because the ground is flat and forms the optical dissolution point we call the horizon. So it's a property of a flat plane. Yeah, but what is, it, what is it disillusioning? What, what is it dis disillusioning? What, the resolution of how far you can see into the distance. The most limited angle. Right. But look, you're using, you're using a more uh, nuanced definition. So what's just the standard definition? The point where the, sky, where the sky appears to meet the ground. Right. So contingent is that is, is two things, correct? The sky and what else? The ground or sea. Correct. So you cannot even have the concept of horizontal without referencing the earth. So when you say parallel to the plane of the horizon, you're saying parallel to the plane of the surface of the earth where it dissolves into the color field of the sky. You're Precisely. literally referencing the Earth directly. You can't avoid it. Unless you want to claim that you're going off of a vertical, right? But vertical is a specific orientation perpendicular to horizontal, which you still can't avoid. So unless you're floating in free space, right? You're, you're, and you've never been anywhere. It's like this, this term horizontal is a specific thing. And what it means is a specific orientation, and that orientation is parallel to the surface of the Earth. Well put. In a particular way. Perfect. Beautifully put. I don't see, I don't see any other way to to argue it personally. Yeah, we ha we have to have a flat right, Earth. But to have a... Go on, John. Vertical and horizontal don't exist in free space. 
vertical horizontal are only with respect to the surface that's oriented. Yeah, he did say that. He, um, he, he, AI did say that. So it's like, well, unless you never experienced anything in your life ever and were existing in free space. So he had to put in a lot of disclaimers to make that statement. But he did get around that already, John. Now, I said all that particularly because if you create a matrix, if you create a matrix of, of, of vertical and horizontal, that's not referenced to an object, right? The problem is... You, you can orient that in any direction, right? There's no grounding for the orientation. Does that make sense? That's, how is the word orientation like, no. defined? Let's just yeah. look it up. Hold on a second. It would have no correlation with the thing you're standing on at all. So then how could you use it in any meaningful way? Is that what you mean? Pre pretty much, but it's like, you know, when you're... Just, just look at well, the you definition, know, you sorry to interrupt you. It Go says ahead. orientation, the action of orientating someone or something relative to points of a compass or other specified positions. So you're, you're trying to take orientation into a place where it has nothing to reference. And that's kind of John's point, isn't it? If, if you're going to orientate anything, it's going to be right. with respect to the plane of the, the ground. Right, so the, the coherence of the very existence of the phenomenon of up and down, of the phenomenon of horizontal, requires that reality itself have a specific orientation. And we reference that orientation to one of two things, and it can only be one of two things, either the, hor the horizon or what we define as vertical. Because, you know, we could claim that we could create a vertical with a plumb line, but we know that these two, or these two orientations are perpendicular. You know, essentially like an X and Y on a graph. Right. And any manufactured so when, horizontal will be parallel with the ground. Sure. If I can just mention it, because the, the, the point of reference on, on the vertical datum uh, that uh, all the elevations are going uh, from, like mean sea level, that's zero elevation from level, from surface. Yes. It's going to be measured from that point onwards, yeah, in degrees of elevation. Yes. I, I don't see the, I don't see why the what's the complication about it. Well, there, it's not even just remove a, that. A point. In, you're talking in in surveying terms, but in terms of navigation, that the, the, they've removed that complication altogether. There is zero elevation change ever. It's all with respect to one elevation. Correct. Right. And so is it in Spain. It's all with respect to one elevation, and the height is with respect to that one elevation. Mean sea level. Right. I'm going to round out. Anybody got any last remarks they want to make? Mm, yeah, man. We got a new member in the chat, Rocket Man. If you guys want to say good morning, I believe this is the fella who uses. Uh, Newtonian equations to fly his rockets into the space. Oh, okay. So, good morning, rocket man. You want to say hello? Or, I don't know if you want to round on Aiden. No, no. If we've got somebody new, I'll say hello. Mm -hmm. Hello, rocket man. I can't see him in the chat. Oh, he's left. He's gone. Is he talking about the equations that use Earth as partial plane? To describe all these uh, rockets leaving it from? I remember hearing him saying mass attracting mass type equations. And he said that since they work and since his rockets fly to space, that proves Earth is a sphere. So maybe he can expand on that. The laws of motion of Newton mass. were not wow. right. End quote, Richard Feynman. Further to that, space is a second law of thermodynamics violation. So none of what he's going to claim is going to work. Well, what he's going to do is he's going to say weight is a result of mass and gravity. But weight is down in air. Um, down doesn't exist on a sphere. Down is with respect to a plane of reference, not a sphere of reference. 
Indeed you do. With that, I'm going to say another huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's after show possible. And of course, a massive thank you to all of you in either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Premier Streams. Hope you're smashing the super chat, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, hitting me up on Ko-Fi or Patreon and all that good stuff. I've been Nathan Oakley and I will see you all in the next video. Day.